All right. So again, some of those highlights from the senses, the optic nerve, cranial nerve two, uh, the vestibular cochlear nerve, cranial nerve eight, uh, the labyrinth, which is found in the inner ear, made up of the semicircular canals, which are involved in balance and posturing, uh, the vestibule and the cochlea, and the cochlea is the snail shell looking part that is involved in uh, hearing. And then there are the bones of the middle ear, the ossicles, sometimes called the ossicular chain, the three smallest bones in the body. There are the malleus, the incus, and the stapes going from lateral to medial. And the rods and cones and the retina and the eye. Uh, those are some of the highlights. The pharynx is the throat. Uh, the throat is a common passageway for both food, beverages, and air moving in and out made up of three parts, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. And this, of course, is an area that can be infected with a type of streptococcal bacterium called a group A beta hemolytic streptococcal pyogenes bacterium. And that would is what we would call strep throat, which is why we call it strep throat, because nobody wants to say that the patient has a group A beta hemolytic streptococcal pyogenes infection of the pharynx, because that's way too much to say. So we compress it. So today we're going to start the endocrine system. And then we're going to do hematology. So does anyone have any questions before we get started? All right, that'll be a no. So let's get started. You should be able to see my screen in about five, four, three, two, one. All right. So I'm starting out with this and I'll tell you why, because with the endocrine system, the endocrine system is made up of organs and glands throughout the body that are secreting hormones. So the endocrine system is all about hormones. The question is then what is a hormone? A hormone is a chemical message that is going to go from one part of the body to the next, to some other part of the body. And it's different than the nervous system because if we wanna send a message very, very quickly, we send it through a nerve that's gonna go at lightning speed, but then the outcome, the result is going to be short acting. Uh, if we want the action to last longer, then we use a chemical message. And all we have to do is put that chemical message in the blood because where does blood go but everywhere? We put that chemical message in the blood and eventually it's going to go to where we want it to go. It's going to go to what we call our target organ or our target cells of that organ. And it's going to make some sort of change happen, which is probably going to have a longer lasting effect. So these two systems, the nervous system and the endocrine system, actually work together, sending messages throughout the body to make changes occur just in two different ways. With the endocrine system, we're talking about chemical messages called hormones. So we're gonna start off with some sort of organ or gland, in this case, the black square, and it's going to release a hormone, which we designate using an arrow, and that is going to act on some other organ or gland telling it to do something. Fairly simple. Well, so far because hormones can work in one of two ways, two basic ways. We have stimulatory hormones or hormones that have a stimulatory effect. And we usually draw that with a straight arrow and sometimes we'll put a plus sign above it. Put a circle around it. Or sometimes we have hormones that act as inhibitory hormones or inhibitory messages, which we draw as this um, angled line and we put a minus sign above it. So, what does this mean, stimulatory and inhibitory? <clears throat> Best example is if you're coming home from the store and you're carrying groceries from the car 
and you have the last of the groceries in your hand and your significant other is standing next to the door and you tell your significant other, I have the last of the groceries, please close the door. That's a stimulatory message. You're telling them specifically to do something. Whereas an inhibitory message, if you were coming back from the store and you had the last, of, you had groceries in your hand and your significant other was standing near the door, you could tell them, I do not have all the groceries. Please do not close the door. You're specifically giving them a message to not do something. That's an inhibitory message. So hormones can be stimulatory, telling an organ or gland specifically to do something, or they can be inhibitory, telling an organ or gland specifically not to do something. <clears throat> now, sometimes this will get confusing because the same hormone that can be a stimulatory hormone in one pathway can end up being an inhibitory hormone in another pathway. So <clears throat> they're not all either stimulatory or inhibitory, it's just sort of what they're going to tell the organ to do, what message they're gonna bring. And you can say, well, that's simple enough. And I agree. However, the endocrine system is not that simple because the endocrine system works in this chain reaction kind of fashion. If it was just one organ or gland that releases one hormone to another organ or gland, well, that would be simple enough, but that's actually not what happens because this organ or gland is going to release another hormone. which is then going to release another hormone, eventually making it to the target organ. So we have this red star organ in our body that the body wants to change, it wants to do something with it. So the message might start several organs away and release a message. In this case, it's the black square that releases this message to the blue circle and the blue circle then releases its hormone to the green triangle which then releases its hormone to the red star which then the red star does what it's ever supposed to do now the question is well then how does these how do these other organs know that the red star actually got the message that's a good question because the red star is going to send a signal back telling the green triangle, I got your message, stop sending me the message. Or maybe it'll send the message back to the blue circle and it will tell the blue circle, I got green triangles message, stop sending your message to green triangle so he'll stop sending his message to me. Or maybe he'll send this message all the way back to the beginning and say, I got green triangles message, so stop sending your message to blue circle, so he'll stop sending his message to green triangle, so he'll stop sending his message to me. We call this a negative feedback. It's, it's a signal that's going back that's saying, I got the message, stop sending the message. However, we can also have something called positive feedback, where this red star got the, dang it, the red star received the message, sends a signal back and says, I got your message, keep sending me more. I liked it. This is positive feedback. I got your message, keep sending me more. Now this will make more sense in a little bit when I give a, an example of what this would be. So now you're thinking, okay, this is starting to look a little confusing with all these arrows everywhere. Well, yes, <clears throat> that's, that's very true. And unfortunately, it gets a little more confusing because that blue hormone right up here that is acting in this pathway, at the very same time, it might be acting somewhere else, telling another organ or gland to do something. And at the same time, 
that same exact hormone might be acting as an inhibitory hormone. Telling something else, don't do something. So that one hormone that's working that pathway to tell the red star to do something might at the same time be working in another pathway to tell the yellowish rectangle to do something while at the same time that same hormone is acting as an inhibitory hormone telling that blue shape not to do something. And now you're thinking, yeah, this could get confusing. Maybe a little bit, but here's the good news. And yes, there is good news. The good news is that this is the endocrine system and these are chemical messages that are being released in the blood. So if we have a patient and the patient has a problem with their red star, their red star organ is not doing whatever it's supposed to be doing. All we gotta do is take some blood from the patient. Because if we take the blood from the patient, we can look in the blood and we can see if there's a mistake somewhere. Maybe that red star is sending a message back saying, I got your message, stop sending me the message. When it never actually got the message. So it's not doing anything. Or maybe one of those hormones along the way is not correct or it's not being sent. So the black Square is sending its message to the blue circle and the blue circle sends its message to the green triangle, but maybe the green triangle is not sending the right amount of hormone or not sending any hormone out. So the red star is never getting the message. So there's a lot of ways that this chain can get interrupted, but it's sort of easy to look for. All we have to do is check the blood and we can look at the levels of these different hormones to see if they are appropriate. And that could help us narrow down the problem. So you see, it's not too bad. Wait, where's my, voila, okay. As I said, the endocrine system and the nervous system can work together, which is why you sometimes see that term neuroendocrine, keeping things together. Chemical messages, these signals are called hormones. And again, I know that most people, when you hear the word hormones, you automatically think of something like libido or sex drive or something along those lines. But they're really just chemical messages that are telling different parts of the body to do something. And all we have to do is put them in the blood and eventually they're gonna go where we want them to go. And when I say where we want them to go, I mean target cells or target organs, and of course those target organs are gonna have cells, so those are gonna be our target cells. And that's kind of what's being demonstrated here. How the end in the first picture on the left, uh, the endocrine cells releasing the hormone into the blood, and then eventually it makes its way to that organ with those cells on it, and those hormones are going to in some way interact with those cells. They might bind to receptors or they might make their way into the cell itself and make a change occur. So what parts of the body make up the endocrine system? Well, that's a good question. As you can see here, there are several parts. And you'll notice something else about these parts that make up the endocrine system they are scattered throughout the body. That's a lot different when you think of other body systems. For instance, if you think of the skeletal system, the skeleton, pretty much all the bones are attached for the most part, except for the hyoid bone, but they all meet another bone. If you think of the nervous system, the brain is connected to the brainstem, connected to the spinal cord, and then all the nerves branch off of the brain and spinal cord, and all the branches come off of those. So they're all kind of connected. And if you think of the respiratory system with the lungs and the airways moving air in and out, it's all connected. And if you think, of, <laughs> excuse me, I'm trying to talk too fast. And if you think of the gastrointestinal system, well, that's just one big giant tube that goes through the body. So it's definitely all connected. 
But with the endocrine system, these parts are scattered all over the place. A little bit different that way. So we'll start way up here in the dying stuff along of the brain. In the dying cephalon in the brain. We first come across the hypothalamus. And we talked a little bit about this in the nervous system. Uh, with regard to the endocrine system, the hypothalamus is the one area that starts a lot of these chain reactions. It release, it has a lot of hormones that are referred to as releasing hormones, where it sort of starts the process. And then, of course, also in the diencephalon, the pineal gland or pineal gland or pineal body or pineal body in the posterior aspect. This is going to release melatonin, which is what helps regulate that circadian rhythm, that wake-sleep cycle. Just in front of the hypothalamus, and actually with a connection, as we'll see, to the hypothalamus is the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is often referred to as the master gland because it releases so many different hormones. And it is a pea-sized gland. It is literally that small. And in fact, it's actually two glands that happen to be right next to each other. There's a, a front part and a back part to the pituitary glands. We call it the anterior pituitary gland and the posterior pituitary gland. Moving down into the lower neck region, we find the thyroid and we'll see that a little bit later on. Uh, and then on the posterior aspects of the thyroid, there are typically four dots of tissues, tissue referred to as the parathyroid glands. They are actually on the posterior aspect. It looks like they're on the front of it here, but in reality, they're more towards the back. Then there's the very interesting thymus, unique thymus, located in the thoracic cavity, directly behind the bones of the sternum, in that area that we refer to as the mediastinum. The thymus is interesting, as we will see. Down onto the kidneys, Each kidney has a cap on its superior aspect, and these are referred to as the adrenal glands. So if there's two kidneys, there are two adrenal glands. And then you can see here the pancreas. The pancreas sort of has a triangular shape to it, sort of. And it sits posterior to the stomach. So I mean literally the stomach, not the abdomen. I'm talking about the actual organ, the stomach. And the head of the pancreas, which is this rounded part here, is actually tucked inside the first loop of small intestines called the duodenum. Because the pancreas has a couple of purposes. The pancreas plays a big role in digestion, breaking things down so we can actually absorb them. But it also has areas that are going to release different hormones. And that's why they have here in parentheses, islets, because these areas called the islets of Lagerhans are going to be the areas with specialized cells that secrete hormones. So we will see those also in a little bit. Then of course, the ovaries and the testes. Now, Later on, in probably week 11, we'll discuss the reproductive aspects involved with the ovaries and the testes. But in this chapter, we are going to merely look at the hormone involvement of the ovaries and the testes. So these are, the, these are considered the main organs of the endocrine system. Now, there are other, there are other organs in the body that also release hormones. For instance, the liver and the kidneys and the heart. In fact, we're gonna talk about some of those a little bit later on. Uh, and these aren't typically considered endocrine organs, but they certainly do release hormones. So 
when it comes to the organs of the endocrine system, we are limiting it to these that we see in front of us here. Not too bad. Hmm. I think, um, yeah, let me go through these very, very quickly. And I'm just, just very basic definitions. These are actually pretty good definitions because they're very, very short and they're to the point. So good way to um, memorize these. These are good things that you could put on a note card, for instance. Tropic hormones target other endocrine glands, helping to stimulate uh, them releasing things, secreting things and growing. Sex hormones target reproductive tissue. I mean, that really makes sense. And then anabolic hormones. Remember, anabolism is building stuff up. So stimulate anabolism in their target cells. Really good, very simple definitions. I, I couldn't even make them any simpler. So good, good stuff to kind of remember. Steroid hormones. These are ones I definitely want you to know about because steroid hormones uh, come from cholesterol. Remember, I've talked about cholesterol, and I talked about how important cholesterol is in making our cell membranes, and it's also important in making these types of hormones. And because both the cell membranes and steroid hormones come from cholesterol, they have this in common, uh, they get along pretty well. And so when steroid hormones meet cell membranes, they just slide right through because they kind of have that history in common. Non-steroid hormones include the protein hormones, and we'll talk about especially this one insulin a little bit later on, glycoprotein hormones, peptides, and amino acid derivative hormones. Not as uh, not something I'm necessarily going to test you on, but I would definitely say just know that they exist as non-steroid hormones, just so you have the uh, difference. Hormones are going to meet some target organ with their target cells, and they're going to have receptors that are very, very specific to that hormone. And they're going to fit, and you'll hear me use this term a lot, like a lock and a key, that is so specific that if something even close comes by, it probably won't even interact in any way whatsoever. Uh, it has to have that right hormone to come along and bind to it and make that change occur. And that's what they're kind of so showing here, these hormones flowing through the blood with this very particular shape. And you can see how when they come across a target cell, those receptors have just the right shape to allow those little blue hormones to fit right in as compared to these non-target cells. Then they're just gonna go right by, not like they're not even there. This is what I was talking about with the steroid hormones. This is a good image here. Basically, this is showing that that steroid hormone, because it is a cholesterol derivative, just like the plasma membrane has that cholesterol in it, they like each other. So steroid hormones just slide right on through the cell membrane. They don't have to bind to a receptor. And then they go in and they go right into the nucleus of the cell. This, this is most of them, at least all but at least all but one. And then once they're in the nucleus of the cell, then they make something happen. In fact, in this case, you can see, they're gonna say, okay, we need a certain protein to be made. And that's exactly what is happening there on the inside of that cell. And then moving to the outside, that ribosome completes it. And now we have a new protein that's been created, all because of that steroid hormone message. Remember, we make two things more than anything else. We make energy and we make proteins. So this is one of those mechanisms where we can make those proteins. I'm not going to get too much into second messenger uh, systems because it does get a little more complicated. But just as it sounds, actually, let me go back to it for a second. Just as it sounds, there's going to be a second step involved. In other words, one thing is going to bind to a hormone is going to bind to one thing, which is going to trigger something else to occur, which is then going to cause another change to happen. So there's a second part to it. So when you hear the term second messenger, that's really just what they're describing. 
I talked about the negative feedback loop. Don't show up there. Just a little more complicated. That negative feedback is going to tell a uh, system to stop sending the message because they got the message. As I said before, there is a positive feedback that we'll talk about a little bit later on that will say, okay, I got your message, keep sending more. And here's a term I want you to hear. I'm not so much gonna test you on it because these do a lot of things, but I want you to hear, the, hear this. Prostaglandins, prostaglandins are types of fats, types of lipids. And they, they have a lot of different things they do. Everything from being involved in pain pathways to stomach secretions uh, in the, the protection of the stomach lining. So there's a lot of different things that prostaglandins are involved in. So at this point, I just kind of want you to hear the word prostaglandin and maybe know that they are a group of fats and stuff that can, that can be like hormones, be like a, a chemical message, also involved in making changes to occur, but nothing more than that. Okay, let's look at the pituitary gland for just a moment. So here, where's the, you can see the hypothalamus has a direct connection down to this area here, which is the pituitary gland. It has a little stock called the infundibulum that connects it. And there's two parts to the pituitary gland, does anterior and posterior. Notice the term beneath pituitary hypothesis. There is an adenohypothesis, that's the anterior, and a neurohypothesis, that's the posterior. At this level, I don't necessarily think that you need to know them as adenohypothesis and neurohypothesis. I think it is sufficient that you can know them as anterior and posterior pituitary gland, because that's a little bit easier. And like I said, this little tiny gland, pea-sized gland, uh, is going to be doing a lot of stuff. Now, if you can't recognize this bone right here, that's okay. This bone right here is the sphenoid bone. Remember the sphenoid bone in the skull is the one that goes from one side to the other, kind of has a butterfly or a horse saddle shape to it. And that sphenoid bone has a little cutout where the pituitary gland sits called the cella tersica. Let me move down here, okay. Uh, there we go. Okay. The cella tersica is a little bony cutout of the sphenoid bone. And you can see here, they've divided the two, the posterior pituitary gland and the anterior pituitary gland and the anterior pituitary gland of these two parts, but don't worry about that. Okay. What else? Uh, one other thing I wanted to say. Oh, the pituitary gland actually, like I said, is two separate glands. They have two separate embryologic origins. In other words, they come from two separate places and just grew next to each other. The anterior pituitary gland has its origin in an area called Rath Rathke's pouch. And the posterior pituitary gland is simply an invagination of the roof of the mouth. So they have these two opposite areas sort of opposite that they originated from and just kind of grew next to each other and, and then became the pituitary gland. So they do have separate embryologic origins. All right, now let's start talking about some of the hormones from the pituitary gland. So we're gonna start off with the hypothalamus. We're gonna represent the hypothalamus as this square. And remember it has that, that little infundibulum, that little uh, connection, if you would, to the pituitary gland. And there are two hormones made in the hypothalamus. Actually, well, there's several, but there's two that I want you to know about. 
that's a D, ADH, <clears throat> which stands for the antidiuretic hormone. And then our good friend, oxytocin. So these two hormones are made in the hypothalamus. Like I said, there are several that are made in the hypothalamus, but these are the two that I kind of want you to know about because those two then get stored and released from the posterior pituitary gland, which I'm going to make look like this. This is the post pituitary, the posterior pituitary, the post pit. So even though ADH, the antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin are made in the hypothalamus, they are moved down that little tunnel and then they are stored and later released from the posterior pituitary gland. So we'll talk about what those do in just a little bit. But of course, if there's a posterior pituitary gland, there is of course an anterior pituitary gland, which I'm going to draw like this. Also known as the adenohypophysis, but we'll call this the anterior pituitary gland or the ant pit. And we'll start talking about some of the hormones that come from here. There are several. So the first one is called thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. Now, the nice thing about this hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, is it tells you in its name what it is and what it does. It is a hormone that stimulates the thyroid. Thyroid stimulating hormone is a hormone that stimulates the thyroid. That's pretty easy. Well, it's going to stimulate the thyroid to release these other hormones called triiodothyronine and thyroxine, or we just call them T3 and T4 because that's easier. And we'll see what those do a little bit later on. But this hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary gland, this hormone is going to, just as the name implies, it is going to stimulate the thyroid. Then there are two hormones called follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone or FSH and LH. Both of these hormones are going to act on the ovaries and testes. So we call them together the gonadotropins because they are acting on the gonads. And follicle stimulating hormone is going to stimulate the ovaries in the female to mature their ova, their eggs, as well as to secrete estradiol. Well, that was going to become estrogen. In males, the follicle stimulating hormone is going to cause sperm production, the spermatozoa, the sperm cells. And this occurs in these little tiny tubules called seminiferous tubules. And again, don't get scared off by the terminology. Tubule is just a, another way to say small little tube, just like organelles was a way to say small organs. So these seminiferous tubules are just little tubes, and that is where the sperm are going to be produced. And that happens as a result of follicle stimulating hormone telling them. Luteinizing hormone, LH, is going to cause the release of the egg, ovulation, and it's going to cause the growth of what's called the corpus luteum, this follicle that fills with fat after the egg is released, which can then produce um, progesterone, another hormone. In males, luteinizing hormone is gonna stimulate uh, the production of testosterone from these cells called interstitial cells. 
And testosterone is, of course, the most abundant and biologically active of the male hormones. So for right now, for right now, I would say, understand that these hormones, FSH and LH together, are going to act on the gonads, the ovaries and the testes. And the female, it's gonna help to drive that menstrual cycle because these hormones uh, that are causing the release of estrogen and progesterone, and those two hormones have a direct reaction or a direct uh, effect in causing that, those changes to occur. So this sort of comes just before estrogen and progesterone. Let's see, the next hormone, ah, you know what, the next hormone is prolactin. And I don't abbreviate prolactin because, well, it's not that long of a word. Prolactin is going to stimulate the development of uh, milk glands of the breasts during puberty, as well as the production of milk during pregnancy. So you're probably familiar with the term lactation or lactating, and we talked about lactose as the sugar of dairy products and lactase, the enzyme that breaks them down. So you can kind of see that prolactin, you can see it in there. So you know it has something to do with milk. So that's an easy way to remember that one, which is a little different from this next one. This next one, I'm definitely going to abbreviate. ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Ad adrenocorticotropic hormone. And you can see why it's just easier to abbreviate it ACTH. This hormone is going to act on those adrenal glands, the ones on top of the kidneys, specifically in the cortex. So the adrenal glands, as we'll see later on, have an inner part, a medulla, and an outer part, a cortex. And the cortex is actually divided into three different areas. So the adrenocorticotropic hormone is going to cause the release of hormones from those three different areas, including aldosterone and cortisol and the androgens. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, then there is growth hormone. Now, you can probably guess what growth hormone is going to do. Yeah, it's gonna cause things to grow. It'll cause things that are capable of growing to grow. Now, the, the confusing part is that it doesn't act directly on things to cause them to grow. It actually acts on the liver. The liver then sends out another hormone, and then that hormone will tell anything that is capable of growing to grow. So there is another step involved. But if you know that growth hormone will eventually cause anything that is capable of growing to grow, I think that's good enough. The fact that the liver is involved and there's another hormone might not be as important at this level. So knowing that the growth hormone will eventually cause anything capable of growing to grow, I think is good enough. Uh, as a side note of the most growth occurs during the growth stages, which occur at the ages of zero to two, four to seven, and then again at puberty. That's when the most growth takes place. Now that does not mean a three-year-old isn't growing, but zero to two, four to seven, and puberty is when the most growth takes place. FYI. Now, there is another hormone 
uh, that was released from the anterior pituitary gland that I don't often include. And I'll tell you why. That hormone is called melanocyte stimulating hormone. And that hormone is going to cause changes to occur in a woman when she's pregnant. It's going to cause this dark line to appear, a vertical line down her abdomen called the linea nigra. And it's going to cause this hyperpigmentation on her face called the mask of pregnancy or chalasma. So, Dr. Surgeon, is that why they say a woman, when, they, when she's pregnant, she's glowing? That could be why, yes. You know, there's, there's also this euphoric stage that happens during pregnancy as well, uh, especially by a week around, around week 20. Um, she starts to enter the euphoric stage, meaning her, her mood's elevated, her energy's elevated. And that also can kind of give that appearance of just general happiness, which can be, you know, something that people could say, well, she's glowing, meaning she's so happy. So it could be from either of those things uh, where they get that term from. But I'm certainly not going to discount that as, as a part of it. Yeah. So the reason I don't include it on here in, in this case, it's clinically insignificant. It really doesn't mean anything. We're not really doing much. But also because depending on the textbook that you read, there's still some question about what it does in men. And because of that, anytime I come across something where there's not a consensus, where there's not um, an agreement it's still possibly unknown, then I say unknown function because I would rather say unknown function right now than say something that is found to be untrue five or 10 years from now. So I'm gonna stick with for right now in males that has an unknown function. That might change tomorrow. They might find it exactly what it means, what it does, but for right now, that's what we're gonna say. So. That's why I don't include it on this list. So that's a lot, I know. Anterior pituitary gland. Thyroid stimulating hormone, then the two gonadotropins, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, FSH and LH, then prolactin, then adrenocorticotropic hormone, growth hormone, One, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. That's plenty. Now, let's talk about the posterior pituitary gland. Well, there's two that I want you to know about. And one of them, I, actually both of them I already mentioned. The first one is ADH, the antidiuretic hormone. Now remember, this hormone is made in the hypothalamus, but then it travels down that little stalk and it's stored and released from the posterior pituitary gland. So what does the antidiuretic hormone do? Well, you may have heard the term diuretics before. You may have heard the term diuretic medication before. If you're familiar with diuretic medications, you know that they are going to cause the patient to pee a lot. For instance, hydrochlorothiazide, also known as HCTZ, also known as the water pill, should be called the make you pee pill because that's what it does. And what is the purpose of making someone pee a lot? Well, remember our water balloon. If someone has high blood pressure, 
and we want to lower it, what we can do is we can take out some of the volume of water. So put a little pinhole in this water balloon and water is going to leak out, which means there's going to be less volume and less pressure. Less volume equals less pressure. Less pressure means lowered blood pressure. So those diuretic medications are gonna help get rid of some of that excess water. Diuretics are gonna help get rid of some of that excess water. So the question then is, well then what does the anti-diuretic hormone do? ADH, it's an anti-diuretic hormone. ADH stops the patient from peeing out. Too much water, H2O. The antidiuretic hormone stops the patient from peeing out too much water. Now, why would we pee out too much water? Good question. Okay. So you're probably at least a little familiar with the idea of somebody having a swimming pool in their backyard, like a big, um, I don't know, just a big swimming pool, one that sits on top of the ground, not a built-in one, but just a big swimming pool. And you know, if they have that big swimming pool, there's going to be some kind of filter attached to it where water leaves the swimming pool, goes through a pipe, goes through the filter. The filter is gonna collect stuff like dirt and twigs and leaves and bugs. And then the water is going to be clean and brought back into the swimming pool. I think that's a concept that most people can at least understand a little bit. That the water leaves the swimming pool with some of these contaminants. And as it goes through the filter, those contaminants are trapped and the water is now clean and it moves into the swimming pool once again as clean water. Most of the water comes back in. You're going to lose a little bit of water in the pipes. We're going to lose a little bit of water in the filters, but most of that water is going to return right back into the swimming pool. Well, you know, our kidneys act like filters to get rid of waste products. And blood travels through our kidneys and those kidneys acting as filters to get rid of waste products. In the process of blood moving through those filters, we actually lose a huge amount of water. A huge amount of water is lost. However, we want most of that water to be brought back into the system. That is the purpose of the antidiuretic hormone. It is gonna help move that water that was lost, about 98% of it, back into the system again. So that only a little bit of water goes out with the rest of the waste products. Most of it that was filtered out comes back in. And that makes sense. Just like with the swimming pool, you want, you filter the water, you want most of the water to come back in. You don't want to have to keep filling the swimming pool all the time. So, when our blood goes through our kidneys and waste products are filtered out, well, we're gonna lose a lot of water. So our body's gonna to wanna to bring that water back in that we lost. This is what the antidiuretic hormone does. It stops the patient from peeing out too much water. So what would happen? What would happen if we blocked the antidiuretic hormone? 
remember this is a hormone that's going to stop the patient from peeing out too much water. If we block that hormone, then the patient is going to pee out more water. And there's two things that you need to know about that are going to block the antidiuretic hormone. One of them is caffeine. The other one is ethanol the type of alcohol found in alcoholic beverages like vodka or wine or beer or whiskey or scotch or rum or other tequila. I'm running out of like, I can't think of any other alcoholic beverages. So those two things, caffeine and ethanol, that type of alcohol block the antidiuretic hormone, which causes the patient to pee out more water, which causes dehydration. This is one of the reasons the person ends up with a hangover the next day because they have become dehydrated. Now, I'm not endorsing drinking to excess, but I do suggest that if you're planning on having a cocktail or two, make sure that you add some extra water into the mix just to maintain hydration. And if you really want to get rid of that hangover the next morning, all you need is a bag of IV fluids, a little bit of vitamins added to it, some potassium added to it, and it'll kick that hangover out like it never happened. This is why in some places, like in Las Vegas, those actual companies run by doctors who will cure your hangover the next morning. They will come to you or they will send some sort of transit to pick you up, bring you back to their office, and they stick a bag of IV fluids in your arm, and poof, the hangover's gone. Or nearly so. Knock it out pretty quickly. Adding the potassium, we used, we used to call that a banana bag. So that is ADH, the antidiuretic hormone stops the patient from peeing out too much water. And then there's just the one left. Our really oops, good friend, oxytocin. Remember, this is created in the hypothalamus but it is stored and released from the posterior pituitary gland. What does oxytocin do? Well, oxytocin is going to stimulate the ejection of milk from the breast when the baby starts to suck, or even when the baby starts to cry. We call this the letdown reflex. A baby crying in another room doesn't even have to be her baby. A baby crying in another room can trigger her brain to release this hormone to cause ejection of milk. That's pretty amazing that it can happen like that, I think. And then another thing that oxytocin does, and this is why we say oxytocin is our friend. Oxytocin is going to stimulate the contraction of the uterus to push the baby out. I just there's I have a question. Okay. Could a woman who did not recently have a baby feed another, like feed a newborn? There's a couple of ways. Yes, if she continue, if she did have a baby a while ago, but she continues to, like, um, stimulate pump breast milk. Yes. Uh, but there's there's also other reasons why milk could be be produced both as side effects and pathological reasons. Why? 
Why do you ask? Because I've seen like pictures of like um, back in the day, it would be like um, what, like, slave women breastfeeding <laughs> other yeah. children that weren't there. So I was thinking, like, yeah. they didn't have a baby. How could they do it? Yeah, called wet nurses. Because they, they had a baby at some point and they just kept the stimulation occurring. This is also why, you know, you'll, you can see some women who will be breastfeeding a five-year-old. I don't recommend it, but. <laughs> you know. As long as there's the ability to produce milk and the stimulus is there, then yeah. Yeah, it's, it's uh, something that royal families used to do all the time. The queen would give birth and then the wet nurses would feed the baby. Or at least some of the feedings. But back to oxytocin. Oxytocin is one of these examples where we see positive feedback that says, I got the message, keep sending more. You know, I talked about the negative feedback where it says, or I say, I got the message, stop sending me the message. And I said, there's some examples of positive feedback where it says, I got the message, keep sending more. This is the textbook example of positive feedback because those uterine contractions start out kind of weak and uncoordinated, but then they get stronger and more coordinated and stronger and more coordinated and stronger and more coordinated. That's because that uterus keeps sending the signal back saying, I got your message, keep sending more. 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 Now, what happens when we have that mother whose labor is just stalling? She has passed the first phase of the first stage of labor. So she's dilated at least four centimeters. And there's no concern of cephalopelvic disproportion or shoulder dystocia or anything like that. But the contractions are just haven't got, haven't picked up much. They're just slow. Well, one thing we could do is we could give mom exogenous oxytocin. Exogenous meaning from the outside of the body coming in. Except in this case, we don't call it exogenous oxytocin. We call it pitocin. We take this off the shelf and we can deliver this directly into mom. Pitocin. So if, you're, if you spend any time on a labor and delivery floor, you will hear the word Pitocin come up a lot. Now, what if mom delivers the baby and mom delivers the placenta and then mom is still having some uterine bleeding, some internal uterine bleeding. Now, most of the time, if somebody has bleeding, what you wanna do is you wanna put pressure on it to help stop or slow the bleeding. But this is coming from inside of the uterus. So how do you get pressure onto the inside of the uterus? Easy, all you do is you make the uterus put pressure on itself by continually contracting. So even though the baby's out and the placenta's out, we can make mom continue to contract and that'll help put pressure on itself basically. And we can do this using Pitocin. So they might continue to give her Pitocin even after the baby and the placenta are already out. Pretty sneaky. Sometimes you'll see the, the doctor um, rubbing the fundus of the uterus, putting pressure on the fundus of the uterus. Sort of tricking the uterus into thinking that there's more stuff inside that needs to come out. So the uterus sends signals back to mom's brain that says, keep sending more oxytocin. So the uterus will continue to contract. 
It'll also help to shrink it down a little bit. Help to expel the uh, the uh, placenta if it hasn't if that hasn't occurred yet. That's why I say oxytocin is our friend. Gets that uterus to contract, get that baby out. Uterus is pretty amazing. Starts out about three inches in length in a nulliparous woman, in a woman who's never ever been pregnant. And then it stretches. People say it grows. It doesn't grow in that it adds new tissue. It stretches to be able to fit a baby and a placenta and all that amniotic fluid and squeeze it all out. And then it goes back to its almost original size. It doesn't go back to original size, but it gets pretty close. The universe is amazing that way, I think. Okay, so agreeably, this is a lot of information. This is one of the reasons why people get a little intimidated with the endocrine system, because there's a lot of new hormones with a lot of big names right from the start. So yeah, there's some stuff to learn, but I try to narrow it down and keep it pretty simple. I do believe I've sent you all the slides as well as all the notes. Uh, so you can use those as well. FYI. Okay. So let's go to here. Does anyone have any questions so far? No. Yeah, Dr. Sturgeon. I'm going through the uh, attendance right now. Yes. Um, the growth hormone, does it have another name? Growth hormone. That's it. Most, sure of these, you, it most, has of these, most of these hormones have uh, some other name of some kind, but no, we're going with growth hormone. Okay. Thank because you. Because you're gonna you're gonna see things like somato with somato meetin, um, but that's actually more the result of the one coming from the liver. So I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. So we're going to go with Thank growth. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. And like I said, with the, with the thyroid hormones, you'll see, it's just easier to call them T3 and T4 rather than triadothyroidine and thyroxine. Nobody calls them that. It's just easier to call them T3 and T4. So that's what you'll hear me say as well. They have the other names. Actually, I think they're listed in the slides. Um, I don't know if I've listed them in my notes, but they definitely are listed in the slides and they're in the text, so you can see them there. Anyone else have a question? No. Okay. All right, well, I think we are going to, okay, let's continue. I'm gonna go back to the slides. What you're gonna see in the slides are some of the definitions of the hormones that we just went over. So I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on some of them. So here we go. You should be able to see my screen in about five, four, three, two, one, zero, right about now. So you can see here, it talks about growth hormone and prolactin. We talked about those. Uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, from the uh, adrenal cortex. And then the two uh, gonadotropins, FSH and LH, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. And I don't know why, but it doesn't include what they do in the testes. Remember, FSH uh, in the testes is going to 
stimulate the production of the spermatozoa, which are the sperm cells, and the luteinizing hormone on the testes will cause the uh, production of uh, testosterone from the interstitial cells. As I said, the hypothalamus is going to have a lot to do with releasing hormones. It creates a lot of these ones that start the process off. And here it's showing the connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And we talked about the negative feedback mechanisms. Here, what it's showing is that there is a, a thyroid releasing hormone that begins in the hypothalamus that is gonna cause the release of a thyroid stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary gland which then causes the release of the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4 from the thyroid. So again, it's just that kind of chain reaction that's occurring. The posterior pituitary gland, remember I said the antidiuretic hormone, ADH and oxytocin. ADH is going to cause that, um, the ability for water to be reabsorbed because we lose so much, uh, water in filtration from the kidneys. It's gonna cause water channels to open up and water come back into the system. Now you'll notice here, they include the, the name vasopressin. I don't usually include this name uh, unless we're talking about the paramedics. When I teach in the paramedics of the anatomy, especially the advanced anatomy, then I include this name because there are specifically medications that still are classified or can be classified as vasopressors. So for them, they would wanna know about that. But for this, not as much. And we talked about our good friend, oxytocin, contracting that uterus, squeezing that baby out. The pineal gland or pineal gland, the diencephalon is responsible for the circadian rhythm, the wake sleep cycle. It causes a release of a melatonin, which makes us tired. So the less sunlight we get, the more active the pineal gland becomes, the more release of melatonin, the more tired we become, which is why in the winter time where we have short days and long nights, we get less sunlight. Less sunlight triggers the release of more melatonin. More melatonin causes us to be tired more which is different from the springtime, where of course in the spring, when we have those longer days, uh, we get more sunlight, we feel like we have more energy and we wanna sleep less. And in the winter time, all we wanna do is eat pierogies and sleep. So that's not a good thing. Now, there is uh, a condition that can occur in some patients with excess amounts, excessive amount of melatonin being released, it can actually cause a type of depression. And this is called seasonal affective disorder, SAD or SAD. And the patients actually do become depressed. And it's not just because it's Christmas and they don't have money for gifts or it's New Year's and nobody loves them. <laughs> It's because of this excessive amount of melatonin that's released. And it actually causes a depression, which can interfere with their lives. It can interfere with their careers or their uh, family lives. So the recommendation is to move. If you live in some place like, well, this area here in the northern United States, northeastern United States, in the wintertime, move south move south to the caribbean pick any island named after a saint and move there you'll get exposed to more sunlight year-round but the holidays and stuff do contribute to people's depressions right or of course for other reasons yeah but that's a depression that can be often taken away if the person suddenly has a lot of money maybe they won the lottery you know, a lot of times um, the stress of gift giving and shopping and all those things. Uh, and then, of course, there's that family where 
you know, loved ones are no longer with them, so they don't get to share the, uh, the, the holidays with them. But those are, sh those are more about sadness, not about true depression. And there's a difference. Uh, when patients have depression, they have what we call anhedonia, meaning they don't find any pleasure or joy in any activity. This is where people often get confused between the, the, the terminology depression and sadness. Uh, a lot of times all young people say to me that they're depressed and I'll say, you know, why? Well, they don't have a job or they're, they don't have enough money to pay the bills or their boyfriend or girlfriend is broken up with them. It's like, well, that's not depression. That's just sadness because life sucks. And you go through tough times. Depression, you know, because then I'll ask, I'll say, do you ever have fun? What do you do for fun? And if they say, well, I go to the, the movies with my friends, or sometimes we meet at my a friend's house for game nights, we play video games, or maybe we go out to the club. I say, well, do you have fun while you're doing that? Yes. Do you laugh? Yeah. Do you have a good time? Yes. Well, then that's not depression. Because depression has that aspect of anhedonia where stuff that they would normally find fun, they don't find any joy in whatsoever. So... The fact that, yeah, sometimes they're sad over some of those things, that's just, life is hard and it's imperfect. And it, it's definitely, it's definitely more imperfect. If you're looking, stop looking at social media, like those Insta books or face grams where people are posting pictures of themselves, where they're on vacation and eating out in fancy restaurants. And well, maybe not right now, but um, you know, you're, you're only seeing a small bit of their life and it's oftentimes, you know, a glamorous life that you see. You don't necessarily see all the garbage part. Everybody has garbage parts. Now, obviously, if we tell this person, hey, if you want to get, if you want to get over this depression, moving to some place like that is going to help. They're probably going to say something like, I can't move to the Caribbean. I have my job here, my family here, my home here, whatever it might be. And that, of course, that makes sense. So an option is actually to get a small, special little UV light that the patient sits in front of for 20 minutes a day, up to about an hour. And it tricks their brain into thinking they're getting more sunlight than they are. And that can actually help. They can do this while they're on their computer or doing something else. And I've had people ask, well then, what about a tanning booth? What if a person goes and sits in a tanning booth? I, and I don't know how long people go in a tanning booth. I don't, I don't think it's more than like 15 minutes or so, but technically, yeah, that would help also. The problem is the tanning booth also brings another concern, which of course would be skin cancer. So not recommended for that reason. But that's that type of depression these patients have definitely interferes with their life and it can affect their careers and their jobs and their families. So it's something to think about. Also, by the way, I, I am aware that melatonin can be purchased over the counter uh, as a sleep aid. Please understand melatonin does not work like an Ambien. It does not work like Benadryl, like you take one and then suddenly you start feeling drowsy. That's not how it works. This is a supplement that is used over a period of time to help regulate that circadian rhythm. So it's not a matter of, well, I want to go to sleep tonight, so I'm going to take some melatonin. Yeah, that, that doesn't work like that. And I'm always concerned about if people are taking the supplement, connects excess melatonin actually cause depression in them? I don't know. I haven't read uh, any medical studies indicating that, but I would still be a little bit concerned about it. So I'm going to think about it. Okay. All right. Let me get out of here. Oops. Get out of here for just a second. Bring us back to where I am. All right. So here is what the thyroid looks like. Sort of a wing-shaped organ here. 
that is sitting around the trachea. You can see the rings of the trachea here. This is the hyoid bone, remember the attachment site for the tongue. And it is the only bone in the body that does not articulate with another bone. Below that, this is referred to as the laryngeal cartilage, although you'll often see it called the thyroid cartilage, but it does surround the larynx, so I like to call it the laryngeal cartilage. Also because this point right here, if I turn it this way, you can see it a little bit more. This point right here is the laryngeal prominence. That is what people call the Adam's apple. That is right here. So you can see in relation, the thyroid is down here, the laryngeal prominence of the Adam's apples up there. And yes, both men and women have a laryngeal prominence. It's just more obvious in men than it is in women. So the thyroid is here. If you want to find your thyroid, you put your fingers at the base of your neck and you swallow, you'll feel your thyroid sort of come up and hit your fingertips. You can take it off this way. You can see there's two wings surrounding uh, that kind of surrounds the uh, the trachea, excuse me. And then there's this isthmus in the middle connecting the two. And if we were to take the thyroid and turn it around this way on the posterior aspect, what you'd be able to see are there's four dots of tissue that are the parathyroid glands, although not evident on this model, that's where we find the parathyroid glands. So let's look at the thyroid and what it does. So you should be back to seeing my screen here now. I'm gonna to go to this picture first. So you can see again, what I was just showing you. Notice they call that the thyroid cartilage right here, surrounding the larynx. I call it the laryngeal cartilage because it surrounds the larynx and that laryngeal prominence. The uh, pyramidal lobe is much more prominent on this example. It's not always that big, but you can see the two lobes connected by that isthmus. And you can see the trachea with the rings of cartilage on the anterior surface and the hyoid bone at the top. So what hormones are released from this thyroid? T3 and T4. T4 is tetraiodothyronine, or sometimes just called thyroxine, which is how you'll hear me call it. And T3 is triiodothyronine. Now, nobody calls them that. Everyone calls them T3 and T4. That just makes sense. So that's how I'm going to refer to them. That's how I would expect most people to refer to them. So what do these hormones do, T3 and T4? Well, first of all, these two hormones act in what we call synergism. In other words, they're both gonna do the same thing. Both T3 and T4 are going to increase metabolism. Now, if you remember, when we talked about metabolism, I said that metabolism is all that stuff that's going on inside of our cells where we are making things, especially making energy and proteins more than anything else. And we are utilizing fuel like glucose and oxygen and water. And then we are creating waste products like the nitrogen-based waste products or carbon dioxide and even heat as a byproduct. So what these two hormones are doing is they're going to speed up that process. If these hormones are released, uh, if they're, let me rephrase that. If there's more of these hormones released, that's going to speed up the metabolism. If there's less of these hormones released, that's going to slow down metabolism. T3 and T4 both do the same thing. The difference is T3 is much more potent than T4. And if, if you think about potency, think about 
a bottle of beer and a shot of whiskey. They both have about an ounce of alcohol, but the whiskey is much more potent. So T3 is much more potent than T4. So the body releases more T4 than T3, about five times more actually. There's also something else that is important to note about these. In order to create these, we have to have something in our diet called iodine, which we can get from like some seafood, we can get from some plants that leaches from the soil. However, here in the United States, we add iodine to our salt. That is why if you look on the label of salt, it reads iodized salt because we add it. And the reason we add iodine to our salt is for the sole purpose of ensuring that our thyroid is working correctly. That's its purpose. That's why it is there. So that our thyroid works correctly. Now, this became an issue, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so, when they started putting something on the market called sea salt. And for some reason, people believed sea salt, which is sodium chloride, is somehow better than other salt, which is sodium chloride. And they marketed it as a healthy alternative, although it is not, it is still just sodium chloride salt. And in fact, the difference is that that sea salt did not have iodine added to it. So people were actually paying more money and getting less benefit from that sea salt. So now, in fact, if you look all the um, labels have to include the fact that it the sea salt does not contain iodine. I think it actually it, they're they're required now to put it on the front that it does not include iodine. So don't buy that sea salt thinking that you're getting something better. You're not. It's still just salt, uh, and in fact, it might be less good for you because you're not getting the benefit of the iodine. And that goes also true with Himalayan pink salt. That was another one that came out a few years ago that people thought was a better healthy alternative for some reason. Probably because it was pink, people aren't intimidated by it. So iodine is necessary to make these two things. Oh man, sorry. Iodine is necessary in order to make these. We do have the ability to convert T4 into T3 if we need to also, by the way, if that makes a difference. So those are two, those are just two of the hormones, by the way, uh, coming from the thyroid. I haven't even talked about this next one yet. Calcitonin. Calcitonin is going to be involved with helping to regulate the amount of calcium that is in the blood. So if there is excess calcium in the blood, and we want to store that excess calcium in the bones, which of course is where we store it, calcitonin will be released to tell osteoblasts to go ahead and get that calcium and build up that bone, because that's what osteoblasts do. They build up bone. So calcitonin is going to help take calcium from the blood and put it into the bone for storage. So the three hormones here, T3, T4, and calcitonin. T3 and T4 both work with metabolism and they are going to increase metabolism and they work together. T3 and T4 work together. And then calcitonin is all about getting calcium from the blood, putting it into the bones. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Then the parathyroid glands, remember they're typically four glands located on the posterior aspect of the thyroid. The parathyroid glands release a hormone called, not surprisingly, parathyroid hormone. That's kind of easy enough to remember. Parathyroid glands release parathyroid hormone. So what does parathyroid hormone do? Well, 
That's interesting because it's actually going to help regulate the amount of calcium that's in the blood. But in this case, it's going to tell the osteoclast we need to get some of that calcium from bone and put it into the blood. So it helps to take calcium and put it into the blood. So these two act sort of against one another. They are antagonists, calcitonin and parathyroid. Now, just because they work against one another doesn't mean that one's working and the other one isn't working. Because if you think about uh, something I talked about a few weeks ago in homeostasis, I talked about when you take a shower, you use hot water, but you also use cold water, two opposites, hot and cold. But you use them at the same time to get just the right temperature. So it's the same kind of an idea where these two, even though they're opposite of one another, can work together to make sure that just the right amount of calcium is getting in the blood, just the right amount of calcium is getting into the bones to be stored. So they can work together that way. Okay. Uh, the thyroid hormone, T3 and T4, increasing metabolism. If a person has hyperthyroidism, then their thyroid is going to create more of those hormones, hyperthyroidism, hyperthyroidism. What's that gonna to do to metabolism? hyperthyroidism, more of those hormones. What's that going to do to metabolism? Anyone? Is it going to make uh, the metabolism rise or go off yeah. more? Yes, it's going to cause things to speed up. It's going to cause things to speed up. So what's their heart rate going to be like, faster or slower? Fast. Probably faster, yeah. And... Are they going to burn through calories or are they going to store calories? I think it's going to burn. They're going to burn them. So are they going to be overweight or underweight? Uh, overweight. Um, underweight. They're going to burn through calories. So they're more likely to be underweight or at least within a normal range. And are they going to have diarrhea or constipation? Now think about this because things are moving fast. Diarrhea. Diarrhea. They're going to move fast to the bathroom because they got diarrhea because everything's moving so fast. They don't get the ability to absorb as much water. So there's more water in their stool. So everything's moving faster. They're going to be constantly tapping their fingers, tapping their toes. Why? Well, because... Everything's moving faster, making a lot of extra energy. And because of that, what do you think their body temperature is going to be like? Is it going to be higher or lower? Higher. It's going to be higher. So when everybody else in the room is sitting there going, it is cold in here. Can you turn the heat up? They're going to sit there and say, I feel just fine. I don't know what you're saying. I think it's okay right now. So what if a patient has hypothyroidism? What's that going to do to metabolism? They're going to gain a lot of weight. They're going to gain weight. Things are going to slow down. So what are they going to complain of? Being obese. Okay, yeah. What else? Tired. Tired. Oh, my goodness. Cannot be that easy. Cannot be that easy. Welcome to medicine. Why do you... Why do you have to memorize the signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism? You already know what they're going to be. You know what's going to slow down metabolism. You know they're going to feel tired. They're going to complain of fatigue. What do you think their body temperature is going to be like, high or low? Low. Low. So when everybody else in the room is saying, it's comfortable in here, what are they saying? 
Oh, there, yeah. Can I get a sweater? It's kind of chilly. Constipation or diarrhea? Sean. Things, things are slowing down. Oh. Constipation. Look at that. So if we have a patient with hypothyroidism, where everything's slowing down, and they're making less they're making less thyroid hormone. Hormone. Okay, turn your mic off because we're getting an echo. Getting an echo. 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 I'm gonna keep saying that until you turn your mic off. Echo. <laughs> okay, that worked. Um, <laughs> I forgot what I was saying now. If a person has hypothyroidism, so they're not making as many of the hormones that they need, we're going to give them hormones. We're going to give them synthetic thyroid hormones. In fact, it's called Synthroid. And that's going to put them back where they should be. Now, the problem is if a person has hyperthyroidism, now, in this case, we might actually have to take the thyroid out because if things are going too fast, that could actually start to interfere with their heart. And that could cause a flutter, maybe even a fibrillation later on. So we might have to take the thyroid out. But then we have a problem because we just took the person who has hyperthyroidism, took their thyroid out. Now they have hypothyroidism. But of course, we're going to correct that by giving them synthetic thyroid hormones. It's ironic that it works out that way. Now, if an infant, newborn, has congenital hypothyroidism, that's a problem. Because that can lead to a condition called cretinism which is going to involve mental retardation. And that's bad. This is why we test every child born in the United States for congenital hypothyroidism. Because if we don't catch this and correct it, they're going to be mentally retarded. That's not good. However, if we catch it and correct it, they'll be fine. If we catch it and give them synthetic thyroid hormones, they'll be fine. So it could be disastrous if we don't catch it or correct it, but it's an easy fix if we do catch it and correct it. That's why every child in the United States is tested for congenital hypothyroidism, just for that purpose. So Good things to know about the thyroid. By the way, the most common type of hyperthyroidism is called Graves' disease. And one thing that you'll see sometimes in these patients is what's called exophthalmus. Their eyes will look like they're bulging out. Like you'll be able to see the sclera all around their eyes, all around their iris. And the most, oops, the most common type of Hypo, oh, wait, yeah. The most common type of hypothyroidism is something called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So you'll hear about this. This is not uncommon. You will hear about both of these things. Chances are somebody you know probably has one of the two. All right, the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands are located on the superior aspect of each of the two kidneys, and they look like a little cap sitting on top. And you can see this cut section of the adrenal gland has a middle part called the medulla and an outer part called the cortex, and there's a capsule around it that helps maintain the integrity. Now, medulla and cortex are just general terms that are often used to describe inner parts and outer parts. And if you look at the cortex, what they've enlarged here, the cortex is divided into three zona layers. Now they don't name them here, 
but they do name them, I think, in the um, laboratory manual. The going from the outside in of the cortex is the zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, zona reticularis. Here they just call them outer, middle, and inner zones. Each one of these zones is responsible for different types of hormones. So remember that adrenocorticotropic hormone from the anterior pituitary gland, it is acting on the cortex here of the adrenal gland. Yeah, they just call them, yeah, in this they just call them outer, middle, and inner zone, which is fine. I mean, not that I'm even gonna test you on that, just knowing that they exist is fine. At least being able to picture that there's three different parts to this cortex is fine. Uh, the mineral corticoids coming from the outer part uh, include one called aldosterone. Aldosterone is a good one to know about because aldosterone is going to regulate the amount of salt in the blood. Now, why is that important? Well, because wherever your salt goes, water follows. So if we increase the amount of salt in the blood, then we're going to increase the amount of water in the blood. If we increase the amount of water in the blood, then we're going to increase the volume of blood, which means we're going to increase blood pressure. So aldosterone in a roundabout way is going to help regulate blood pressure, make sure there's enough of it in other words. So this is, of the mineral corticoids, this is the most important one to know about, aldosterone. Regulates the salt, which is going to regulate water in the blood, which is going to help regulate blood pressure. Uh, the glucocortico there are glucocorticoids coming from the middle include cortisol. And cortisol is going to have a direct effect on things like uh, using glucose and carbohydrates and storing these things and where to store them and when to use them. So it has an effect on glucose, let's put it that way. And then that inner layer, that is going to release uh, what I simply refer to as the androgens, rather than calling them the gonadocorticoids, we refer to them as the androgens. Um, these are the sex hormones, not including testosterone, of course. So what's that big middle part of the adrenal glands? What does that do? That releases these two. Notice the term here, catecholamines. Catecholamines. You'll hear that term from time to time. So when you think of the catecholamines, think of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Epinephrine is what people call adrenaline, which is released during times of fight or flight. Remember that sympathetic division uh, of the peripheral nervous system. I lost the train of thought there. Uh, the sympathetic division of the peripheral nervous system. This is what people call adrenaline, epinephrine. And then norepinephrine, which actually works as a neurotransmitter. So I think we talked about that uh, back in the nervous system part. I said that epinephrine is more of the hormone, norepinephrine is more of the neurotransmitter. Epinephrine has the additional methyl group, <clears throat> excuse me, that makes the difference. There, sorry about that. Now to the pancreas. How important is the pancreas? Well, let me see here. First, let's go to the location again. I want to make sure everyone is clear on this. The pancreas is located in the abdominal pelvic cavity in the area we refer to as the retroperitoneal space. It is located posterior to the stomach. It is tucked inside the first part, the first loop of small intestines called the duodenum. You can see there is a head to the pancreas, 
a body to the pancreas, and then a tail to the pancreas. And the tail of the pancreas points right over to the spleen. So if you're not sure where the spleen is located, just find your stomach, which is in the upper left quadrant of your abdominal pelvic cavity. The pancreas is directly behind the stomach and the tail of the pancreas is going to point to your spleen. And you, excuse me, and you can see here that they have these ducts, the common bile duct and the pancreatic duct are emptying directly into the small intestines, that first part. So that's why it's an important component in digestion. Then you can see these islet cells, these areas called the islets of Lagerhans, and there are alpha cells, beta cells, and delta cells. Now, the two most important ones that we're gonna talk about are the alpha and the beta. We're not gonna to worry too much about a couple of the other ones here, but the alpha and the beta cells are of exceptional importance. Oh, here you see the term islets of Lagerhans. I already mentioned that a little bit ago. Okay, so let's see. Alpha cells secrete glucagon, beta cells secrete insulin. So what do these do? Glucagon is released during the starvation state. So when I say starvation, I don't mean that a person's been on a life raft in the ocean floating for six days and hasn't eaten. I mean that time period in between breakfast and lunch and lunch and dinner and dinner and breakfast, especially when it starts to get longer and longer. So there's that time where our body has to maintain a certain amount of glucose in the blood so that it can be available to cells when they need it. Because remember, I don't call glucose blood sugar, I call glucose cell sugar, because that's where it needs to be. The blood is just there to transport it. But we wanna make sure there's always a certain amount in the blood so that when the cells do need it, it's right there for them. So in order to maintain that during these long stretches where you've gone without eating, we have to break down that storage form of glucose and put the glucose back into the blood. And you remember I said, glucose is most quickly stored as glycogen. I said, that's like the hull closet. It's quick to store and quick to retrieve, quick to store, quick to retrieve, quick to store, quick to retrieve. So we can get that and break it back down and say, okay, we need you to be glucose again, very, very quickly. That's what glucagon does. It is released during that time. And notice here, it also reads, stimulates gluconeogenesis. In other words, the creation of new glucose. Insulin released from the beta cells. Insulin is released during the well-fed state. So you just had that cheese steak and those cheese fries, and you put all that extra carbohydrates and now glucose into the body. And now the body has to take that glucose and put it into cells that need it or to, and or to storage cells. So what is going to do that? We need a delivery guy. And that's what insulin is. Insulin is the guy who delivers glucose to where it needs to go. Because remember, glucose doesn't know what cells to go to. And it's too big to get into the cells. It needs to go through a doorway. But it doesn't have the code to open the door. Insulin has the code. And insulin knows where it needs to go. So insulin takes glucose and says, come with me. I'm going to take you to the cell that needs it, opens up the door and pushes glucose in. So glucagon released from the alpha cells is released during the starvation state. Insulin released from the beta cells is released during the well-fed state. These two hormones are working opposite of one another. However, once again, we can look at the 
shower analogy and know that when we take a shower, we use opposites at the same time. We use hot and cold water to get just that right temperature. And then sometimes somebody flushes a toilet and we have to turn the hot way down and the cold way up in order to get that balance back again. So the same thing happens in our body. We can have both of these working at the same time, trying to maintain just that right amount. And then there's times where maybe we skip lunch completely. And now we have to get use a lot more glucagon and a lot less insulin for the moment in order to create that glucose. So there will be times where they will sort of shift like that. I'm not going to worry about the pancreatic polypeptide, nor will I worry about this regulating hormone somatostatin from the delta cells because, well, the other two are much, 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 much more important. So I'd much rather you know about glucagon from the alpha cells during the starvation state and insulin from the beta cells during the well-fed state. And remember, think of insulin as that delivery guy. Oops. Good. Any questions about that? No. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah, I wanted you to explain the, the difference between the uh, osteoblast and the uh, and osteoclast. I didn't get it right. So if you can please explain a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's actually pretty simple. I try and make it simple at least. I'll try and I'm trying to make it simple. Um osteoblasts, so specialized bone cells that help to build up bone. Osteoclasts are specialized cell bone, bone cells that break down bone, or as I call, or as I like to say, osteoclasts collapse bone. Because that's kind of like breaking it down, collapses it. And of course, osteoclast begins with a C, osteoblasts begin with a B, osteoblast builds up bone, osteoclast collapses the bone. And in the process of building up, we're going to store calcium. And in the process of collapsing, we're going to release calcium. So we're either going to be taking calcium from the blood and putting it in, or taking calcium from the bone and releasing it into the blood. You know, our bodies, once they're created, we're not done with them, right? Once you're an adult, you're 22 years old, you're not done with your body. Like it'll never, nothing will change again. Nothing's going to, uh, no, let, me put it, let me say it a different way. Your body always has to go through maintenance and repair. So just like the highway, where they will block off one lane of the highway and they'll go down with a machine that tears up all the old asphalt. And then another machine comes in shortly behind it and puts down brand new asphalt. And then they, they block off the other lane of the highway. And now they tear that up and they replace that with brand new. Our bodies go through this same process of repair and maintenance where tissues, including bone, get broken down on a regular basis. Blood vessels get broken down on a regular basis and then rebuilt up again. So we have to have special machinery that will go through and do this break those things down and rebuild them back up. 
So you can kind of think of the osteoblasts as the rebuilding and the osteoclasts as the collapsing. I say collapsing because it begins with a C, osteoclasts with a C collapse. Uh, sir? Yes. Do you know what caused the pancreas to be inflamed? It depends. Um, pancreatitis can occur as a result of things like alcohol abuse. There's one possibility. But it, it is not something you see as precancerous. Pancreatic cancer doesn't necessarily demonstrate inflammation, but it is bad. Pancreatic cancer is deadly, usually about a year from diagnosis is all they have. Sometimes two years, but mostly it's usually within a year from diagnosis. But yeah, one of the most common causes of pancreatitis is um, chronic, like chronic alcoholism. And what's happening at that stage to the pancreas? Some of those cells get overworked to the point where they're damaged. We see something similar with diabetes. specifically type two diabetes, sorry. Though I suppose you could see it in type one early on. Can't you have your pancreas right. removed? Can't you have it removed? Part it's of it, yeah. Like in a, in a Whipple procedure. They remove part of the pancreas, but that's kind of a big deal. I mean, that's like that's not a um, that's not a procedure like having a gallbladder taken out or an appendix taken out. Taking out part of the pancreas in that in a procedure like a Whipple procedure means that things are bad. It's sort of a I don't want to say a hell mary pass, but it, it's kind of a big deal surgery. It means that things could be bad. With, with diabetes, I don't know if you've had a chance to watch the video on YouTube, uh, I did a video on the scary truth of diabetes. Because I think that people, I think people aren't afraid of diabetes and they should be. And it's effect on the pancreas and, and the rest of the body as well that, you, that occurs. Um, I think people for the most part have this polite image of diabetes where a person has to check their blood sugar or maybe take a pill, cut out the sweets, um, maybe take insulin. And that's about it. And that is definitely the most polite version of diabetes because it gets scary. And the stuff that happens, the way the those cells are damaged and the way that that causes damage to the rest of the body is frightening. There's two types of diabetes, type one and type two. 
two main types, we'll say, type one and type two. And type one is just bad luck. That's one that used to be called juvenile diabetes or insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. It's just bad luck. It's just either something has occurred at the genetic level or it might be the result of a virus. Because, you know, if we don't know what causes something, we blame it on a virus. We don't know what virus, we blame the Epstein Barr virus. But there's not much you can do for that. Patients aren't making insulin or not making enough insulin. So they need insulin. So we got to give them insulin. And then, of course, we want to make sure they're living a healthy lifestyle. The problem, the real problem, is type 2 diabetes. Uh, and about 75% of the people in the United States who have diabetes mellitus have type 2. And this is the result of damaging those cells over time from eating unhealthy and not exercising and eventually it's going to cause other things in the body to go bad it'll cause decreased blood flow to some tissue poor wound healing that's why they start cutting off toes and feet and legs cause uh, renal failure. That's why they go into dialysis. Cause heart failure. Is, that, the worst... is that the one where it uh, create too much insulin? Initially. Yeah, initially. And the, the reason for that is because their bodies, their body gets so much of those um, carbohydrates. Remember, carbohydrates in and of themselves aren't bad. We have to have carbohydrates. But the problem is people take in too many carbohydrates, more than they, more than they need, more than they realize. Here's, here's the example that I always like to give. I give the example of the, of the mother who feeds her child chocolate cake for breakfast and then chocolate cake for lunch and gives the child chocolate cake for a snack. And then for dinner, they have chocolate cake. And the next morning they have chocolate cake for breakfast, chocolate cake for lunch, chocolate cake for snack, chocolate cake for dinner. And the next day, chocolate cake for breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner. And most people would say, well, that's a bad mother because she shouldn't be giving her child chocolate cake uh, every day for every meal. And the mother, of course, would say, well, you know, chocolate cake has eggs, which are healthy, and we need sugar, and there's sugar in there, there's milk. But we know the truth. We know that chocolate cake is 98% bad stuff and 2% stuff that we need or we could use. So it's not meant to be a meal. It's meant to be a, a treat, it's something you have once in a while. You're not supposed to be making a meal out of it. But the reality is, she's not giving her child chocolate cake. She's the reality is she's stopping at a restaurant that she goes through a drive through I don't want to mention any names because I don't want to get sued, but I'll say that you're loving it and gets her child like a waffly breakfast sandwich. And then at school, the kid gets a lunch that is made up of deep fried chicken fat with little tiny pieces of chicken inside. And then for a snack, the child gets uh, some pop tarts or a bag of chips. And then for dinner, dad brings home something in a styrofoam container. And the problem is they think this is real food, but it's not. All of that stuff has the same nutritional value as chocolate cake. It's not real food. And that's something they just don't understand. They think it's food because they see the commercials on TV of people eating these things and they think that's food, but it's not. And I'm not saying that restaurant or restaurants like that are bad. I'm not saying that at all. Um, I'm saying that those are foods that you eat once in a while as a treat, not as a meal every single day. That's the problem. And because people are taking in so much of this, what does the body have to do? Well, if there's a lot of glucose coming in, what's the body going to make more of? Well, it's going to make more insulin. And then more, and then more, and then more, and then more. And over time, 
this thing's going to start to break down a little bit. And we're going to say, well, you have to change your lifestyle. You have to eat healthy and exercise more. But how do you tell a 40-year-old over-the-road truck driver who drives for eight or 10 hours a day and only stops at those little fast food restaurants that he has to eat healthy and exercise more? He's just going to say, you know, Doc, can't you just give me a pill? And that's where it starts. So yeah, they get a pill. And that works for a while until they're in their 60s and 70s. Now that doesn't work anymore. So now they have to take it. So, And then we're cutting off toes and cutting off feet and cutting off legs. And they go into renal failure. They go into that dialysis. They have heart failure. And they're miserable. It's a miserable way to live their life. Because when a person's on dialysis, they're going to dialysis three days a week. Which means the other days, of the, and, and once you're going for dialysis, your day is wiped out. That's it. Because even when you're done with dialysis, you're just going to sleep. They're just going to sleep. But their other days are taken up with other doctor visits, eye doctor visits, endocrine doctor visits, cardiologists, neurologists, all these other doctor visits on all these other days. That's how they live their life. They're miserable and they have no energy and they feel terrible. And all they had to do was change. All they had to do was live a healthy lifestyle and they could have stopped it. They could have reversed it even or prevented it altogether. And, you know, I, I tell people this, I tell you guys this because I don't want to hear people later on in life say, I wish I would have listened to Dr. Sturgeon. I wish I would have listened to what he said. I would rather you forget my name completely and say, boy, I'm really glad I listened to that guy uh, back when I was learning about medicine because now I'm healthier because of it. I don't remember what, he, what his name was, but I'm glad I listened to his advice because now I live a healthier lifestyle. That's much more important to me that you actually make sure you do this, especially if there's people in your family that have uh, diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, it puts you at such a higher risk. It's miserable. It's a terrible, terrible thing to go through. And all you have to do is, is change a lifestyle, live a healthy lifestyle. And I know it's difficult, you know, growing up back in, when I was growing up back in the 1930s, um, we didn't have all these options with internet and 197,000 channels on TV. And if we were hungry at nine o'clock at night and there was no food in the fridge, we had to wait till the next day. And then walk down to the market and get something to eat. And if you look at um, like movie reels, not like actual movies, but like film. Dr. Sturgeon, we can't hear you. Did everybody volume go out? Yes, mine went out. Yes, mine did. I can't hear nothing either. Did anyone text him and let him know? I'll do it.
He said, okay, he'll be right back. Okay, I apologize. Apparently, at some point in time, I got kicked out. Yeah, and I really wanted to hear what you were saying. <laughs> I don't know. I was in my very passionate speech about diabetes. And I was, I was standing up. I was waving my arms around. I was yelling and kicking things over, very passionate. And then my phone says, oh, we can't hear you. So I don't know how much you heard or did not hear. I don't know the last thing you heard me say. Anyone wanna help me out? No, okay. Uh, you want us to remember a long time from now that, um even if we just remember a guy told us not to, you know, like to eat. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. I don't know where I was in the rant from that point. Oh, well. Oh, you said even if you have you said if you have people in your family that has diabetes that puts you at um high risk. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, I want I want people to be as scared of diabetes as they are of some of these other things. Uh, and unfortunately they're not. It's they become too complacent. And they don't see the long-term effects. And the long-term effects are pretty ugly and deadly. So I guess that's all I have to say about that. Please go watch the video on YouTube. Scary truth about diabetes. Like, subscribe, and share it with people you know. Let everybody know. Uh, about diabetes so that they know how that they should be scared of this um, it's no way to live a life things just get worse all right well let me go back to where i don't know even know where i was uh -huh. let me take a look We're gonna go back to the slides. Okay. Oh, that's, you might wanna check your mic there. A lot of noise, oops. Okay, so the testes. The seminiferous tubules are the ones that create the spermatozoa, sperm cells. And the interstitial cells are the cells that produce testosterone, responsible for uh, secondary sexual characteristics. The ovaries produce estrogen and progesterone. These two things together uh, work in the menstrual cycle. And estrogen is the one responsible for the secondary female sexual characteristics. Now, women also make uh, small amounts of testosterone. Men, they don't actually make estrogen. They sort of convert another hormone to estrogen. So they still have small levels of estrogen, but they don't actually make it, whereas women actually do produce testosterone. So it's a little bit different. The placenta. 
The placenta is the thing that attaches, it embeds into the uterus and it has a connection to the baby. So baby's blood leaves the baby, goes through the umbilical cord, goes through the vessels of the placenta, picks up nutrients, and then brings those nutrients back to the baby. So mama's blood and baby's blood don't mix while the baby is growing inside. However, the placenta has other jobs that it does. When it first starts out, the placenta, the early placenta, starts out as something called the chorion. And that's going to eventually become the placenta. But the chorion, as it embeds into the endometrium of the uterus, is going to release a hormone called beta human chorionic gonadotropin hormone, or just HCG, which is a lot easier to say. And HCG is going to do two things. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to tell the uterus that we are in baby making mode. So we need to get more nutrients, more blood supply, bring it over this way. The other thing this hormone is going to do, so this is a hormone that is released from the early placenta and goes into mom's tissues and therefore mom's blood supply. The second thing it's going to do is it's going to freeze the menstrual cycle so that the menstrual cycle stops, which is exactly what we would want to happen if she is pregnant. We don't want a menstrual cycle to continue. Then, because this hormone has entered mom's tissues and entered mom's blood supply, it's also going to get filtered out by mom's kidneys. So when she goes and pees on that stick, what that stick is looking for is HCG. If it says HCG is present, she is pregnant. Even if it's a dollar general pregnancy test, if it says she is pregnant, she is pregnant. And that is true 99% of the time. And the other 1% is bad news. It means something else is happening that is not good. Which is why I'm always surprised when the young woman would come in and say, I took four pregnancy tests and they all came back positive. You didn't need four. One would have been sufficient. If it comes back positive, yep, yeah, pregnant. Then the chorion eventually is going to grow into what we call the placenta. And it is going to release estrogen. I'm not going to worry about the other ones here, but it is going to release estrogen, which is going to help to maintain that menstrual cycle being frozen, stopped because we don't want to continue it. You see, part of that menstrual cycle includes the ischemic phase. Ischemia is when we cut off blood supply. That's why all that extra endometrial tissue that she created during that time period is lost along with blood and mucus and tissue. All that comes out as part of the menses, in other words, her period. So in order for the period to happen, we have to cut off the blood supply first. That is part of the cycle, the ischemic phase. That is part of that cycle. So if we freeze the menstrual cycle, then there'll be no ischemic phase, which means there'll be no menses. In other words, no period.
What that means is a woman who is pregnant cannot have her period while she is pregnant. And I know people will say, well, that's not true. I know people who've had their period when they were pregnant. Nope, you didn't. Because they didn't. Because you can't have a period when you're pregnant. There can be implantation bleeding that occurs very early on in the pregnancy, like at the beginning of the, uh, well, when it implants. But any other bleeding that occurs is probably cervical bleeding. It's not a, men's, it's not a menstrual period. I'm not saying there can't be bleeding, but it's not a menstrual period. That can't happen. But I know everyone will say, well, I know someone, they said they had their period through their entire pregnancy. No, they just had bleeding through their entire pregnancy. Not necessarily a good thing, by the way. FYI. Okay, that's all I want to say about placenta. Man, we we're so close. I was really hoping to get through this. Um, just finish up. The thymus. Remember, the thymus is found in the thoracic cavity. It is found right behind the sternum in that area we refer to as the mediastinum, the central area of the thoracic cavity. And here's what I want you to remember about the thymus. I don't, not so much about the thymus and the, the, the hormones. What I want you to remember about the thymus is this is a very unique organ. It actually gets smaller as we get bigger. That doesn't happen with our, most of our organs, right? If we are a baby, then we have a baby-sized liver. As we get older into adulthood, we have an adult-sized liver. As we're a baby, we have a baby-sized stomach. As we become an adult, we have an adult-sized stomach. Things get bigger. This organ actually gets smaller. It shrinks down. And it's not just that it stays the same and everything grows bigger around it it actually gets smaller as we get bigger. And it does play a role in the immune, in immunity, in the immune system. So you can kind of remember that, but what I, what I want you to remember about is its location behind the bones of the sternum, the mediastinum, and the fact that it gets smaller as we get bigger. That's kind of unique. Of these, uh, let's see, we'll probably talk about gastrin secretin later on. We'll probably talk about cholecystokinin later on too. CCK, cholecystokinin. This causes the gallbladder to release bile. There's a fatty meal coming through. And ghrelin has been, um, been researched regarding obesity. Because that it has to do with um, increasing appetite. So there's been a lot of research done around Graylin as well, but we're not gonna to talk too much about those. And here it just tells you that the heart does in fact release hormones, natriotic peptide and atriotic peptide, natriotic hormone. So like I said before, other organs in the body release hormones, but they're not necessarily considered part of the ester uh, considered part of the endocrine system. That should be it. That's it. Okay. Wait, that's all I want. There we go. Takes us to. Okay. So, for a room. So, before we switch into blood, let's take a bit of a break. Come, yeah. Are you ready to start talking about blood? 
I'll take that as a yes. Yes. Like <laughs> I can tell. You have to say anything. Hematology, the study of blood. So normally I would ask students, what does blood do? And it's funny because I would get answers like, well, it bleeds. Well, blood doesn't bleed. That's a leak. That's not something you want to happen. Uh, the purpose of blood is very simple. In fact, it's a one word answer. Transports. Right. Yeah, that's what it does. It transports. And then one would ask, well, what does it transport? It transports things that we need to places where we need them. So you can say, well, what about oxygen? Well, yeah, it transports oxygen. What about hormones? Yeah. What about glucose? Yeah. What about proteins? Yeah. Amino acids? Yeah. What about salt? Yeah. Uh, those things that we need, it transports them to where we need them to be. And then it also transports waste products waste products like carbon dioxide and it's going to transport that to where we need to get rid of it or those nitrogen-based wastes it even transports heat because you'll remember when we talked about metabolism i said every cell in your body creates heat as a byproduct not just muscle cells, that's what people have you believe that only muscle cells create heat, that's not true. All cells in your body create heat. So we can take that heat and put it into the blood. In other words, the blood picks up some of that heat and it's gonna transport it. And it's gonna transport it to places like the skin. Then the heat goes from the blood to the skin and then from the skin, to the outside world. So that's what blood does. It does it pretty well, in fact. So we're gonna start by looking at what blood is made of. Let's take a look. Nope, try that again. Try that again. Okay, so you should be seeing my screen right about, oh, I don't know, probably now when you should see it. Yeah, there, there it is, look at that. Blood, chapter 16, blood. A fluid transport medium. Remember, blood is considered a connective tissue because it kind of connects all the tissues in the body because it goes everywhere. There's two parts to blood, and let me show it here first. There's two parts to blood. There is a liquid part, and there is a solid part. So the liquid part is called plasma, and it makes up about 55% of your blood. And then the solid part is what we call formed elements which makes up about 45% well, of your blood. Formed elements, meaning red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets fall into the category of formed elements. And there's a lot of red blood cells. In fact, there's so many red blood cells in your blood that it makes your blood appear to be red. When people ask how much blood is an adult human being, I say about five liters, because that's a good average. If you look here, males have five to six, females have four to five. So I think just saying five liters is, that's good. That gives a good average, because if we lose three of those five liters without replacement, that's it, we die. So about five liters of blood. Now, of course, a pregnant female, she's going to have an increase in blood volume of 30%, 40%, or even more in some cases. Excuse me, Dr. Surgeon. Is it a um, I mean, is it a certain amount of blood transfusions you can get, you can a person can get, or it doesn't matter? You mean like over their lifetime or at one time? Like, like at one time. Well, again, uh if there's 
three leaders lost without any replacement, they're, they're, that's not going to make a difference. They're going to die. So if a person is leaking that much blood and they have to continually get more and more and more blood into them, it's not going to maintain blood pressure sufficiently enough. And what needs to be done is that blood needs to, well, where, where it's leaking, it needs to be stopped. So I guess theoretically you could continue to just keep pumping blood through a person, um, but there would definitely be changes, alterations in blood pressure, which could cause changes in things like the heart rate, which could be dangerous. And when we talk about, you know, that's giving blood products. We talk about transfusions, that means we're giving blood products, but also maybe removing some things. Uh, sir, do the blood um, do the anesthesiologists um, do they do blood transfusions? The anesthesiologist does not in, in and of themselves, but they can participate depending upon what the situation is, why this person needs blood. The anesthesiologist is the gas man. Going to do things to create a condition without feeling or sensation. And that's just if you break down the word, right? And there's different blood products that can be given. There's some differences in them and why, well, we might, we'll probably get into that a little bit later on uh, in the slides here. But for right now, looking at just what blood is made, made up of, looking at the plasma, which is a yellowish to clearish colored liquid, You'll notice about 91% of it is water. And depending upon the book that you read, some will say 90%, some will say 92%. So 91% is kind of a good split. So that's a good number. So about 91% of plasma is water. And if plasma makes up more than half of your blood, that means almost half of your blood is made up of water. But then we see things like proteins in the plasma. And if I were to say, remember one protein more than any other, it would be albumin. Albumin is the most prevalent of the plasma proteins. It is a large carrier protein. So you can think of it as like one of those big flatbed trucks that can carry a lot of different things. That's what albumin is. It's a big carrier protein that carries things. And you can see the percentage of it. There's a lot of it. Other solutes found in plasma, remember solutes are solid particles suspended in a liquid, include these things that you see here, nutrients, wastes, et cetera. Then looking at the formed elements, the erythrocytes, those are the red blood cells, and you know they're red blood cells because erythro means red. So that makes up a huge portion of our formed elements. Remember, there's so many red blood cells in the blood that it makes the blood appear to be red. There's a lot of them there. The leukocytes are the white blood cells. The number is not as high. But these are bigger cells. 
And you can see they break down the different types of white blood cells, neutrophils being the most prevalent. And we'll talk about these in a little bit. And then platelets. Platelets, well, technically platelets aren't a cell. Platelets are a fragment of a cell. They are important in the blood clotting process. as we will see. Because they're not a cell, they don't have a nucleus. And they have a pretty short lifespan, about seven days. That's different from the red blood cell, which also does not have a nucleus, which has a lifespan of about 120 days. Erythrocytes are mature red blood cells. Thrombocytes are platelets. Platelets are thrombocytes, which is a little misleading in the name because thrombo means clot. And they are an important part of the blood clotting process. That is true. But cyto means cell. So you might define that as cells that clot, except platelets aren't actually cells. They're fragments of cells. So it's a little bit misleading in the name thrombocyte. And then leukocyte, well, leuco is white. So leukocytes are white blood cells. And I don't know why they didn't include it, but of course you could abbreviate that WBCs, just like red blood cells are abbreviated RBCs, white blood cells, WBCs. Red blood cells, erythrocytes, these have a unique shape to them. They are a biconcave disc shape that does not have a nucleus, nor does it have other things like mitochondria. Well, why not? Why do red blood cells not have these other things? You may recall in the past, I have described red blood cells as, oops, that's that looking bus. I've described red blood cells as being like buses. And of course, buses carry passengers. So these red blood cell buses carry passengers as well. But of course, their passengers are things like oxygen. And there are seats on this red blood cell bus. And the seats are what we call hemoglobin, which is abbreviated capital H small b. And those seats have to have some kind of framework. We call that framework iron, just abbreviated FE, iron. And as I said, the passengers on this bus, molecular oxygen. So one thing you'll notice when you get on a bus is there's a lot of seats. There's not a whole lot of room for anything else. Why is that? Well, the more seats that you put on a bus, the more passengers you can get on a bus. So you wouldn't put a big table in the middle of it because, well, that would take up space where you could have more seats and more passengers. So red blood cells as a bus that carries oxygen, it wants to have as many seats as possible. More seats, that means more passengers. More passengers means more oxygen. But more seats also means less room. So we got to get rid of the nucleus. No nucleus, no mitochondria. Get rid of those ribosomes. That, that stuff takes up space. We don't want to have all that stuff taking up space. We want to have as many seats as possible. That's why a red blood cell's lifespan is only about 120 days. It can't make any repairs. It doesn't have any directions. There's no nucleus. 
This is also why a red blood cell has the shape that it does, because hemoglobin is a round molecule. Often described as sort of a globe-shaped molecule. And the red blood cell has a very flexible membrane. A biconcave shape. If you look at it from the side, it kind of looks like this. Not a very good biconcave shape. Let me try that again. There we go. If you look at it, oh, that's bad. If you look at it from the top, it's round with an indented area, kind of like a donut, but it's not punched all the way through. Why does it have this rounded shape to it? Well, because it is full of these round hemoglobin molecules. I say round, they'll, they'll be described as globe shape, but I say round because that makes sense. So you pack a bunch of round marbles inside of a flexible membrane, it's going to take on that round shape. Imagine what would happen if the hemoglobin was a stick shape. If the hemoglobin was a stick shape, then the red blood cell would be a stick shape. which is exactly what happens in sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia causes the red blood cells to take on that stick sickle shape because the hemoglobin is wrong. Instead of being round, it's more of a stick shape. And that's not good because when these red blood cell buses have to go through the smallest capillaries, the smallest blood vessels, they have to be flexible so that they can fit through. They go through single file and they have to flex as they go through. If a red blood cell has this stick shape to it, well, then it loses its flexibility and it doesn't go through this those tiny little capillaries, which means things are gonna back up. And that's not good. Oxygen is not going to get delivered to where it needs to go. And that's not good. So FYI. Yeah, nice picture of them. Functions of the red blood cell. Mm, carry oxygen. Can red blood cells also carry carbon dioxide? Yes. Can red blood cells also carry nitric oxide? Yes. Am I worried about those? Nope, because mainly what it's carrying is oxygen. That's its main job more than anything else. It's carrying oxygen. So that is what I'd want people to know more than anything else, that red blood cells carrying oxygen. And there's a bunch of those seats, that hemoglobin inside composed of four globin or protein chains. Adult hemoglobin has two alpha chains and two beta chains, makes the four components into that globe or round shape. One hemoglobin molecule combined with four oxygen molecules, so that's four O2s, to form what is called oxyhemoglobin. And of course, combined to carbon dioxide to form carbaminohemoglobin. But that one, I'm not as concerned about that, you know. I'd much rather you know about oxygen sitting in those hemoglobin seats. And then we come to this word anemia. Anemia is a sign of a disease. Anemia is a sign of a disease. Just like a fever is a sign. 
not everyone who has a fever has Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever. Not everyone who has a fever has yellow fever. Not everyone who has a fever has Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. A fever is just a sign of a disease. So anemia is just a sign of a disease. Not every person who has anemia has sickle cell anemia. Not every person who has anemia has iron deficiency anemia. Not every person who has anemia has aplastic anemia. So the definition they give you there is a little bit misleading. Anemia just indicates that there's a problem in the oxygen delivery system. And a system, of course, meaning those buses. Doesn't mean there's not enough of them, but there's some kind of problem that's not delivering as it should be. Anemia is a sign of disease. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about this. Just not right now. Because this is going to demonstrate something really important that people need to understand. And we are going to talk about that after a short break. Here. Okay, now does anyone have any questions before we get back into the lecture? Yes, no, maybe, okay. All right, so we're gonna start off talking about blood cells. And when I say blood cells, I mean all of the blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and even those fragments of blood cells we call platelets or thrombocytes. So let's take a look at the origin of all of these cells, because this is an important thing to understand. This, I'm gonna use a phrase, concept map, to help visualize some of these pathways that are utilized in order to make these blood cells. So here we go. You should, hopefully, be able to see my screen. Uh, right about now, well, not yet, about now? Yeah, about now. Okay. So if we look at this diagram, we see at the bottom here, we see erythrocytes. Uh, those, are white, those are red blood cells, excuse me. Those are red blood cells. Those are mature red blood cells specifically. Then we see a bunch of white blood cells, something called a basophil, another called an eosinophil, that is how we pronounce this word, eosinophil. We pronounce the E, then we pronounce the O, then it is a cinephil, eosinophil. And then that neutrophil, remember I said the neutrophil is the one that really is the most common of all the white blood cells. The most prevalent makes up somewhere around 65% of all the white blood cells. Then we see lymphocytes, monocytes, and then finally the platelets, the thrombocytes. So where do these cells originate? Well, let's go backwards up here. And what we will find is that all of these cells have one thing in common. They all start from this cell here. They call it a hemocytoblast. I call it a hematopoietic pluripotential stem cell. They call it a hemocytoblast, same thing. So this one cell can become any of these at the bottom. All we have to do is tell it to. All we have to do is tell that hemocytoblast or hematopoietic pluripotential stem cell, all we have to do is tell it to become a red blood cell or tell it 
to become an eosinophil or tell it to become a neutrophil. And it will start down that pathway and eventually become that cell. And once it started down that pathway, it can't go backwards. So that one cell at the very top has the potential, which is why I call it a pluripotential, lots of potential, to become any one of those cells along the bottom or even the parts that we call platelets. So that hemocytoblast or hematopoietic pluripotential stem cell has a nucleus, which of course has DNA, which are the directions on how to make things. Because if we need to make eosinophils, well, then we must have directions somewhere. And if we need to make red blood cells, mature red blood cells, they must have directions on how to make them. If we, have, we want to make a lymphocyte, well, there must be directions somewhere. And of course, that's in the DNA. So, you know, any cell that has a nucleus has chromosomes and therefore DNA. So this cell has a nucleus, all the directions are in there. So if we want it to become a neutrophil, we have to tell it to become a neutrophil. Hey, become a neutrophil. And what it will do is it will start down this myeloblast pathway you see in green to a progranulocyte and then to the neutrophilic myelocyte, then to the band cell, to finally that neutrophil at the bottom. If we want that one cell to change and become a mature red blood cell, then we have to tell it to. We have to say, hey, become a red blood cell. And when it does, it's gonna start down this proerythroblast pathway down to the reticulocyte and eventually to the mature red blood cell, the erythrocyte. Now, where is this happening, first of all? This is occurring in our bone marrow, specifically our red bone marrow. You said this bone marrow, bone marrow, sir? Yes, specifically red bone marrow. Okay. All of our blood cells are created in our bone marrow, specifically the red bone marrow, not like the yellow that we'd find, the fat that we'd find, like the, the diaphesis of a long bone. So all of this is happening in our bone marrow. This is what bone marrow does. That's, that's a big deal. Because remember, <clears throat> we have so many red blood cells in our blood, it makes our blood appear to be red. And red blood cells are incredibly important because they're delivering oxygen. They're the buses that are carrying oxygen around the body. And remember, oxygen is important because, well, we need that to make things like energy, which we make more than anything else. Remember, glucose, oxygen, and water. So we have to deliver the oxygen. So we have to have the red blood cells. So they have to be made. And that's where it's happening in the bone marrow. Now, here's where it gets a, a little tricky. And I'll tell you why. Because you may have heard me say this before, so I'll say it, but I'll say it again. We make about one to two million red blood cells every second. Every second, we make one to two million red blood cells. Every second, we make one to two million red blood cells. Well, that's a lot. I can't imagine making one to two million of anything in a second. 
And some books will say as high as five million, but <clears throat> I think that might be under certain circumstances. I think most of the time we're making one to two million red blood cells every second. That's because they're important. That's because they carry oxygen. We need oxygen to make energy. We need energy in all our cells in order for them to do things. So if we're making one, two million red blood cells every second, that means every second, one of these hemocytoblast cells is being told to make a red blood cell. Not one of them, excuse me. One to two million of these hematopoietic pluripotential stem cells or hemocytoblast cells Every second, one to two million of these are being told, hey, you gotta become a red blood cell. So it goes down this pathway. But at the same time, they're also being told to make white blood cells and eventually becoming platelets as well. So you gotta wonder how many of these do we have to start with? Because if we're making one to two million red blood cells every second, not to mention all the other cells, Aren't we going to run out? Well, you would think so. I hope you would think so. But how about this? In order for this to become a red blood cell, it needs to be told to become a red blood cell, right? So if I say to this hemocytoblast, hey, hemocytoblast, I need you to become a red blood cell. The hemocytoblast will say, okay, I can do that. But first, I'm going to make a copy of myself. So one becomes two. And then the original one says, okay, now I'll go down and I'll start becoming a red blood cell. So if we started out with one, we still have one left. So every time this cell is told, hey, I need you to become a neutrophil, I need you to become an eosinophil, I need you to become a basophil, I need you to become a lymphocyte, I need you to become a red blood cell. Every time this cell is told, hey, I need you to become something, it says, okay, wait, first of all, I'm going to make a copy of myself. That way we don't run out. Kind of makes sense. But here's the thing about making a copy of oneself. When you're a cell and you have to copy yourself, the first thing you copy is all the DNA. And that's expensive. Not in money, but in energy. That requires a lot of energy in order to do that. But then also, if every time you're being told to change into something and you say, well, I gotta make a copy of myself first and you copy the DNA, after a while, you're making copies of copies from copies of copies from copies of copies of copies. Remember what we talked about a couple of weeks ago and I said that if you put a piece of paper on a copy machine and you make a copy of the printing on that piece of paper, and then you take the copy of that and you make a copy. And then you take that copy and use that to make a copy. Over time, whatever's written on that page starts to fade and maybe becomes unreadable. That means over time, the more these hemocytoblasts have to make copies of themselves, the more likely they are to make a mistake in the DNA which means the more likely that next cell will be different from the one before. And when cells change, we have a name for that. We call that cancer. So what will start to make sense is when you spend time around a lot of elderly patients, And you start to hear that these elderly patients are developing bone marrow cancer. And you think, how are they developing bone marrow cancer? They've been exposed to too many x-rays or radiation. 
No, they've just been alive a long time. And remember, over our lifetime, the more that these cells divide and make copies of themselves, the more likely there are to be mistakes, the more likely there's going to change, more likely for cancer. That's why, generally speaking, in elderly patients, the most common cancer is skin cancer, because our skin cells are constantly dividing throughout our lifetime. The second most common cancer in elderly patients, generally speaking, is bone marrow cancer. And then third is colon cancer. But this is the reason why. Because these cells have to copy themselves before they start down a pathway. Otherwise, we'd run out of hemocytoblasts. It's an important concept. And it doesn't really tell you this in the book. So going down here, you'll notice that this hemocytoblast following this myeloblast line then becomes a progranulocyte, which can become any one of these three, which will eventually become either a basophil, an eosinophil, or a neutrophil. Or the hemocytoblast might become, go down this line to become a lymphocyte from the lymphoblast down here to become a lymphocyte. Or it might go down the monoblast to become a monocyte. Or it might become a megakaryoblast to become a megakaryocyte. And watch what happens to the megakaryocyte. Parts of it break off. Those parts are what we call platelets. This is why I say a platelet is not a complete cell. It's a fragment of a cell. The platelet is not a complete cell. It is just a fragment of a cell, but are active in the blood clotting process. So all of our blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and even the platelets come from the bone marrow. And they all have the one thing in common. They all come from this one hematopoietic pluripotential stem cell, or as they call it, a hemocytoblast. And did I mention that we make one to two million red blood cells every second? So here's a question you should be asking yourself right now. You should be saying, wait a minute. You told us meaning me, red blood cells don't have a nucleus. But this cell starts out with a nucleus, and this proerythroblast has a nucleus, and the basophilic erythroblast has a nucleus, and the polychromatic erythroblast has a nucleus. But then, look what happens in the reticulocyte. That nucleus starts to fade. Because remember, we don't have room for our nucleus inside of erythrocytes. We want to have just seats in there. We just want to have hemoglobin. So the nucleus actually breaks apart. Is that where and, it gets its color? I'm sorry? Is that where it gets its color? No. No, because that part, those particles are actually removed. That's what the spleen does, in fact. That's one of the jobs of the spleen. As red blood cells go through there, the spleen will remove those particles, those nuclear remnants, as we call them. The red color is actually from the hemoglobin molecule, especially with iron attached to it, it becomes a red molecule. And there's so much hemoglobin inside of a red blood cell, it makes the red blood cell appear to be red. And there's so many red blood cells in the blood, it makes the blood appear to be red. So it really is down at the hemoglobin level. Hemoglobin is a red molecule, especially with iron attached to it. Sir. Sir. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, yeah. Um, instead of the cells, when they make a copy of itself, and as time go by and you get older and they start to fade away and it becomes cancer, like is there some type of way that maybe it can, instead of becoming cancer, Maybe that cell can start over from the beginning of the process again? No. Instead of no. Oh. No. The reason the cell changes is because it's just following the directions. The directions, of course, are the DNA. 
And if you, again, if you took a piece of paper that had writing on it, maybe like, uh, maybe if you took a recipe out of a recipe book on how to make chocolate cake, and you took that, just that page out, and you put that page on a copy machine, and you Xerox copied the page, well, the next copy you got off of that would be almost identical. It'd be easy to read. You'd be able to follow those directions. Well, if you then took that copy and made a copy from that copy and then took that new copy you just made and used that to make a copy and then take the new copy you just made and made that and use that to make a copy and you do that a hundred times, by the time you get to that hundredth copy, it's gonna have some fading. You're not going to be able to read it as clearly. You might misread the directions. Instead of putting a half of cup of something in, you put two cups of something in, which means it's going to make a, be a completely different recipe now. That cake's not going to come out the same. It's going to be different. So once it starts down that pathway, you can't revert back to a brand new cell with perfect DNA again. That's just not going to happen. Okay, thank you. At, at least not with the technology we have right now. You know, there might be a time in the future we could say, okay, let's just start over with new DNA, perhaps. But where we are right now today, we don't have that type of technology. So we have to let our bodies do what they're going to do. And again, that's true with uh, cancers in general. That's why patients get cancer as they get older, where cells just start to change. And the change occurs mostly because of uh, internal changes, the DNA changes. I mean, it happens right now. It's happening inside of you now. But the changes are minimal, and you have an immune system that picks up on it and destroys them. Gets rid of those bad cells. So the chemotherapy, uh, what is that doing to the cell? Mm, good question. The thing about these cells, when they change like that, they start to go through the process of dividing faster. They go through this process of making more and more copies of themselves faster. So chemotherapy is specifically designed to kill rapidly dividing cells. That's, its, that's what it does. Now the problem of course then is that we have other cells in our body that are rapidly dividing like skin cells, which is why a side effect from that chemotherapy is uh, dry or irritated skin. Hair cells, which is why a side effect of chemotherapy is the loss of hair. Uh, gastrointestinal cells, mucosa cells in the intestines, which is why side effects of the chemotherapy are things like uh, vomiting and diarrhea. So we have to accept those side effects in order to try to destroy all the bad rapidly dividing cells. That's the plan. So if a person I'm going to go a little off topic here, but if a person has something like a leukemia, which is a cancer of the white blood cells, let's pick this, let's just pick neutrophil. Let's say it's a, it is some kind of a cancer with this neutrophil cell. It only involves the neutrophil cell for some reason. So only this cell is bad. The problem is the body 
says, hey, we need to have more neutrophils in the body. And I don't see as many neutrophils as we need. We need a thousand more neutrophils and they're just not here. So what does the bone marrow do? Well, the bone marrow is going to say, okay, well, this cell has to become a thousand of those neutrophils. So let's get a thousand of those cells down and start down this pathway. <coughs> Man. <coughs> Excuse me, I can't talk as fast as I used to. <sighs> Go down this pathway and become neutrophils. The problem is then it makes a thousand cells that are wrong. Let me, let me demonstrate it a different way. Let me show it like this. Stick with that idea though. Okay, so let's say a neutrophil normally looks like this. We'll put a little red eye here. So the body says, well, we need to make a thousand of these neutrophils. So it tells the bone marrow to make a thousand neutrophils. The problem is because the directions are wrong, the body doesn't make a thousand of the ones that look like the Pac-Man. Instead, it makes a thousand of these. Those are wrong. They can't do what the neutrophil does. They look wrong. They're just not neutrophils. The body says, wait a minute. Where are my thousand neutrophils? I thought I said make a thousand neutrophils. So it sends a message to the bone marrow. says, look, we needed a thousand more neutrophils. So the bone marrow says, okay, I'll make a thousand more. But unfortunately, because the directions are messed up, it makes a thousand more of these and then the body says wait a minute where are my thousand neutrophils i thought i ordered a thousand neutrophils sends a message to the bone marrow tells the bone marrow i need a thousand neutrophils bone marrow says gee i thought we did that but okay here's a thousand more neutrophils and the body says wait a minute where are my neutrophils because he's looking for these so I, I ordered a thousand of these. Goes back to the bone marrow, says, I need more, I need a thousand neutrophils. Bone marrow says, okay, make a thousand neutrophils. But it keeps making them wrong. It keeps making them wrong because the directions are wrong. The DNA is wrong. How did the DNA get wrong? That's not a question I can answer. You're going to have to talk to somebody uh, above me. We'll put it that way. And it like, can't itself, correct? Yeah. Yeah. This is a, this is just a mistake that happens. Sometimes mistakes happen. Wait, this is cancer, right? Yep. This is this is a leukemia. Because normally, if we look at a blood smear under a microscope, we would see a whole bunch of white blood cells, all kind of white blood cells. And then in that same area, we might see one of the white blood cells. So we'd see a whole bunch of red blood cells, maybe one white blood cell in this one little area under a microscope. In leukemia, what we're going to see is a whole bunch of red blood cells, but then we're also gonna see a whole bunch of white blood cells, but they're wrong white blood cells. They're not doing what they're supposed to do, and there's way too many of them. Now, what's the problem with that? So what? So there's a lot of white blood cells that can't do what they're supposed to do. No big deal. Remember what this guy up here is doing. He's making these cells and 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 these cells and, these cells and platelets. He's making all these other cells. But if he is so busy trying to make that one cell that's wrong because he keeps getting ordered to, says, hey, we need these, we need these, we need these, then he stops making these other types of cells to focus on making more and more of those wrong cells. Let 
which means now those other cells can't do their jobs either. So now we have all these white blood cells that are wrong, so they can't help out. And then we have less of the other white blood cells because it's too busy making these wrong ones. And so the person ends up in a position where their immune system is severely weak. So, and then they get infection and they die. Oh, so they just die. Like it's no treatment. Yeah. And you see the problem is somewhere maybe like here, the directions on how to make that neutrophil are wrong. Or maybe here, or maybe here. But we don't have the technology to go in and fix just that one page of directions. Come back a hundred years from now, we might then. But right now, we don't have that type of technology to go in and just fix that one little problem. So do you know what we do? We wipe out all of this. Like pouring gasoline on a file, filing cabinet and lighting a match. So the metal filing cabinet is still there, but everything inside of it is burnt to a crisp. Then we take out files from other cabinets that we know are correct and we stick them in that filing cabinet. We call that a bone marrow transplant. If that sounds messy, like why do you have to go and destroy everything just because of that one bad thing of directions? Why have to go through and destroy the whole thing? Because that's all we've got. We don't have the technology to go in and individually wipe out one little page and then replace it with one little page. We have to wipe out all of it and then replace all of it. That's a bone marrow transplant. So what's the chances of surviving after a bone marrow transplant? It depends on the type and it depends on the patient. And it depends on their age. But typically we put, with any cancer, we go in five-year increments, five-year survival rates. Can you go into remission after bone uh, marrow transplant? That, that would be the five-year survival rates. Because what does remission mean? That it um it reverses. No. Which, I mean, it go back to the way it was. Um, we can't say that because if we could say that, then we'd say you're cured, because going back to the way that it was would be a cure, right? But we don't know for sure if they're cured. We don't know for sure that all of the bad cells are gone because there's no way to know that in most cases. So all we can say is the patient isn't experiencing any sign, any, sorry, any symptoms, and we can't see any signs. So there's no evidence visible to us and the patient isn't complaining of anything, but we don't know for sure that it's gone. So we cannot say the patient is cured but instead we can say the patient is in remission. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. They're not suffering any symptoms. We're not seeing any signs, but we can't know for sure because that just isn't possible, at least with most cases and at least not yet. Maybe in the future. Anyway, we got a little off topic there. We got to get back into topic here.
what this is showing here is how external factors can sort of help change uh, the way that our body sends oxygen around. So in this case, it's showing that in changes in altitude, um, there's going to be external pressure changes are going to create internal pressure changes in us. And when that happens, our body could interpret that as, in this case, meaning that we need more red blood cells. So a signal gets sent to the kidneys. The kidneys secrete a hormone called erythropoietin that will tell the bone marrow, make more red blood cells and take the ones you've already started to mature and mature them faster and get them out into the system. So that's what that is demonstrating, this change in altitude. Lifespan of red blood cells, about 120 days. A good thing to remember, 120 days. When the blood cell breaks apart, it's gonna release the hemoglobin and the iron's gonna separate and it's gonna break down into these components, including bilirubin, which is a yellow pigmented component that needs to go to the liver. And when that gets to the liver, it gets joined up with his friend. We call it conjugated bilirubin. And when it gets conjugated, when it gets joined up, uh, then it becomes useful and we can utilize it in, in making bile. Bile is that thick, yellow, bitter tasting stuff you throw up after you throw up everything else. Bile is involved in. Uh, the breakdown of fats, the term we use is emulsification. It's a fancy word of saying the breakdown of fat, emulsification of fat. And if we cannot connect up that to bilirubin, if we cannot conjugate, if the liver is not doing its job to conjugate it, well, then the body's just going to store that bilirubin in the skin and the conjunctiva make the skin and conjunctiva appear to be yellow. John, John Something we call jaundice, also known as icterus. And in the conjunctiva, it makes the whites of the eyes appear to be yellow. We call that scleral icterus. And that is the result of this guy, Billy Rubin, not getting joined up with his friend in the liver because for some reason the liver is not doing its job. Well, the liver has like 500 jobs, so it's not doing its jobs, and that's one of the jobs that it does. And what is the friend name in the liver again, sir? Uh, with the help, Billy Rubin, with the help of UDP glucuronal transferase. It's joined up. That's why I didn't include that because there's no need for you to know UDP glucuronal transferase. Just the fact that it, it gets joined up, that it meets up with its friend and now, that, now it becomes useful. But if you want it, it's U as an umbrella, D as in Daniel, P is in Paul, UDP, glucuronal, G L U C O N Y L, I believe, glucuronal transferase, T R A N S F E R A S E. Voila. Thank you. Something along those lines, yes. Okay. On to the white blood cells, because you just can't wait, can you? You want to learn about white blood cells, and you know what? I don't blame you, because this is pretty interesting stuff. Now, looking at this micrograph of a white blood cell, Notice the measurement here is in micrometers. 
that U is a micrometer. This white blood cell, I don't know which one this is. That's not true. I know exactly which one this is, and I'll tell you why. You see the purple inside, the really dark, dark purple. That's the nucleus. And the thing about these white blood cells is some of them have very distinct nuclei. And the thing about a neutrophil, which is what this cell is, is it has what we call a polymorpho nucleus. Poly means much or many. Morpho means shape. So the nucleus has a lot of different shapes to it. Polymorpho nucleated leukocyte, which is why sometimes this is called a PMN or neutrophil PMN. So let me tell you about some of these white blood cells here. At some point in time, some guy or gal or, or both were the first ones to look through a microscope and look at these white blood cells and notice something. They noticed that in some of these white blood cells, there's that nucleus, some of these white blood cells had little specks inside of their cytoplasm, like grains of sand, like little tiny specks of stuff, little granules of something inside of their cytoplasm. Hmm, weird. And they noticed that some of the white blood cells, they didn't have any specks of anything inside of their cytoplasm. So they thought, well, here's what we'll do. We'll just classify them very easily. Cells that have granules and cells that do not have granules. Easy way to classify them. So we'll group them together that way. So we'll take all the types of white blood cells that have the granules and we will call them, wait for it, granulocytes cells with granules and all the ones that don't have granules a granulocytes because a means without or not so cells without granules all right so now that we have classifications to go by let's look at some of the ones that have granules and the first one is the most prevalent and that is the one i've talked about a little bit that is the neutrophil, which makes up somewhere around 65% of all the white blood cells in your body are neutrophils. They are sometimes called PMNs, polymorphonucleated leukocyte, because they have that, <laughs> that nucleus that has a lot of different shapes to it. And neutrophils are a type of a macrophage that can go around gobbling up all kind of stuff. But his specialty, what he is most specific for gobbling up is bacteria. So if someone has an infection and that infection is a bacterial infection, then the body's gonna say, well, we better get more neutrophils into the system because if there's bacteria, well, we're gonna have to get more neutrophils there to gobble them up and destroy them. So when you take that person's blood and you do a blood cell count, you're going to find their neutrophils are high. Well, that's because the body's fighting off a bacterial infection. All 
I'll do it in blue just to make color different. The next great, oh, dang it. I don't need to do that. The next, dang it. The next granulocyte is called an eosinophil. Oops. Sinophil. There's one too many S's in there. Eosinophil. Sorry about that. Eosinophil. You pronounce the E, then the O, then it's a cinephil. And eosinophils make up somewhere mm, around 2%, approximately 2% of all the white blood cells in the body. They too are phagocytes that can go around gobbling things up. But they're going to gobble up stuff like allergens and parasites. The last of the granulocytes, that's the basophils. Basophils make up less than 1% of all the white blood cells in the body. They are not phagocytes. They do not go around gobbling things up. However, they do release histamine. and heparin in the blood. I, specific, I specify in the blood because there are other cells that specifically will release histamine in the tissues. And histamine will increase vasopermeability and Heparin will increase blood flow as it decreases coagulability. In other words, decreases the clotting factors, the clot, the clotability. This is a word. Granulocytes. And A granulocytes. Let's take just a moment and talk about one of the A granulocytes, the lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are the, wait, let me go with numbers first. Lymphocytes make up about 30% of all the white blood cells in your body. Some books will say 20 to 25, some will say 30 to 35. I'm just kind of splitting the difference here. Lymphocytes make up about 30% of all the white blood cells in your body. They are the smallest white blood cell. They're still bigger than a red blood cell, but not by a whole lot. They too can be phagocytes gobbling things up, but they are most specific for viruses. So now with this little bit of information, let's consider a case study. A patient comes into the hospital and is diagnosed with pneumonia. Now, we're going to um, admit this patient into the hospital. And because we've made the diagnosis of pneumonia, we are going to assume that it's community acquired pneumonia because it probably is. And if it's community acquired pneumonia, it's probably bacterial because it probably is. So we're going to start the patient on a broad spectrum antibiotic. But then 
I am also going to order something. I'm going to order a CBC with diff. I'm going to order a complete blood cell count. In other words, I want to know how many red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets there are. But not only do I want to know how many red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets there are, I also want to know how many of each of the white blood cells there are. That's the differential part, or as it's commonly abbreviated, diff. I don't want to know just total number of white blood cells. I want to know how many neutrophils, how many eosinophils, how many lymphocytes. I want numbers here, people. But why is that? Well, what if this person that we've admitted to the hospital with pneumonia, and we assumed it was community acquired, we assumed it was bacterial, we started on a broad spectrum antibiotic, but when we took their blood and did a blood cell count with a differential, we found out that neutrophils were only a little bit high. They were pretty close to where they should be. But we found the lymphocytes were really high. This person had a lot of lymphocytes. Well, what are lymphocytes most specific for? Mm, viruses. So what's causing this patient's pneumonia? Is it a bacterium? A virus? It's a virus. If it was a bacterial pneumonia, then the neutrophils would be really, really high. But the lymphocytes are the ones that are really, really high. That tells us the body's not trying to fight off a bacterial infection. The body's trying to fight off viral infection. Now, remember I told you earlier that we started this patient on a broad spectrum antibiotic? Is that going to help? No. No, no. We're going to have to switch it to an antiviral, like a mantadine, maybe. I don't know. I'm just throwing one out there. But that broad spectrum anti antibiotic isn't going to help. What if the patient instead had high eosinophils? Well, this would be caused by a parasite. Parasite. Which yeah. means. Yeah, which means antibiotics not going to help with this. If it's a parasite, we might have to use an antiparasitic. Shut up. It can't be this easy. Look <laughs> at this. Look how easy medicine is. Now you know. Now you know why when that patient comes in and they say, we're going to take his blood. You're like, why are you taking his blood if you know he has pneumonia? Well, we want to know what causes it. Well, what are you going to look for? Are you going to see actual bacteria in his blood? No. We're going to look for the white blood cells because those white blood cells give us a lot of information. You see how that works. Do you? I know you do. All right. Very nice. Good connections. but we're not done. Oh no, we're not done. Although I will take a break in just a few minutes because I want to talk about lymphocytes for just a second. Remember, these are the smallest of the white blood cells, most specific for viral infections. Lymphocytes can then become T cells or B cells, depending upon where they 
mature in the bone marrow or in the thymus. And if they become a T cell, it can become something called a helper T cell, which is sometimes described as a, oops, shoot. Let me try that again. As a CD4 cell. So I'm going to just see a plus sign up here too. CD4. Or they can become a suppressor T cell. Also known as a CD8 cell. Or they can become a natural killer cell. Sometimes called an NK cell or a cytotoxic T cell, as a for instance. We'll see what B cells do a little bit later on. But why am I telling you all this? Why do you care? Because this sounds like it's getting very complicated. And why are you learning such complicated information? Well, it's because of this right here. Helper T cells, which is a type of a lymphocyte. Problem is, helper T cells have an enemy. Here is a helper T cell, HTC. The enemy to the helper T cell is the human immunodeficiency virus. And this virus, remember viruses are really small, much, much smaller than cells. This virus chooses the helper T cell goes inside and uses up all the equipment and all of the nutrients to make more and more and more copies of itself. And then each one of these will now leave and go into a new helper T cell. So one goes in, a hundred comes out. And each one of those hundred then go into a hundred new helper T cell. And each one of those will create a hundred more. And I'm just, I'm just using round numbers so you can get an idea of the problem that starts to get created here. In the meantime, this helper T cell, it's gonna die. Used up all of its nutrients, all of its energy. That's it. Meanwhile, there's more and more and more of these viruses being made, which are all going into more and more helper T cells, which means more and more and more helper T cells are dying, which means the body tries to keep up. After a while, it just can't. Because as the body makes more helper T cells, well, that's just making more fuel for these viruses. So if a person is HIV positive and they've been diagnosed with an opportunistic infection, opportunistic infection, And their helper T cell count is less than 200 cells per cubic millimeter. Then we say the patient now has the disease AIDS. Not full blown AIDS. That's not a thing, that's an exaggeration. 
just like when we see that woman who's nine and a half months pregnant and we say, wow, she is really pregnant. Well, she's not really pregnant. She's just as pregnant as pregnant, but we make that exaggeration. So when someone says full-blown AIDS, that's not a real thing. That's an exaggeration. In order for the patient to have the disease AIDS, first they must be HIV positive. And then there must be the diagnosis of an opportunistic infection, as well as a helper T cell count below 200 cells per cubic millimeter. When those two criteria are met, and I'm just basically, this is the basic criteria. When those have been met, then we say the patient has the disease AIDS. Simplified it a little bit, but that's the, that's the idea. So why did I talk about lymphocytes and then lymphocytes can become T cells and B cells and then T cells can become helper T cells or cytotoxic T cells or natural killer cells or suppressor T cells? Because it's this helper T cell, which is a type of a lymphocyte, which let me remind you is most specific for destroying viruses, is being destroyed by a virus. Is pretty incredible, I think. No one else cares. All right. Okay, well, I tried. So before I go into this, this next spot, I just want to take a quick five minute break, six minute break. If that's okay. That all right? Yes. Uh, yes, I will be putting this on YouTube, but uh, there's also one already up there from yesterday that's pretty much the exact same lecture. Although we may have gotten a little bit further along, but that's okay because we'll catch up uh, next week. So you can certainly watch that if you want to. but. Okay, but I'm going to take a quick couple minutes. So just a few extra, just a few minutes there to gather my thoughts and try to see where we're going to uh, finish here to create a plan for the rest of the day, uh, the last bit of the day that we have uh, and for next week. So clearly, I don't think we're going to be able to get into the cardiology today, which I didn't really expect that we'd be able to get into it, but you never know. I know sometimes I get off track a little bit, but sometimes that's also necessary because, you know, it helps to create a bigger picture. <clears throat> and that's what I was trying to do. So let's Try and get back into it here. So if you are ready, we are going to jump back into this for just a moment. Again, gonna try to teach you a little bit of a big picture thing happening here. So I'm abbreviating some of the steps a bit, simplifying some of the steps a bit, because this is delving into some immunology. And immunology is complicated. And the more you go into it, the more complicated it becomes. And without a really good understanding of some of the cell biology, uh, it makes it much, much more complicated. So I'm just going to be scratching the surface and creating a big picture here. So makes it a little more a little easier to understand so we're going to start out with that'll work we're going to start out with a bad guy this uh oh hold on to me okay 
we're going to start out with a bad guy that has come into the body. And we know he's a bad guy because he looks very different than our other cells. Remember those antigens that stick out from the <clears throat> cell membrane, for instance, is very, very different. Than our own cells. So as this bad guy has entered our body, we have cells like this guy here who just stumbles across him and says, hey, you don't belong here. You look really different. I'm going to kill you now. That's what he does. Gobbles him up and destroys the bad guy. But he then, dang it, he then tells somebody, he tells a B cell. Remember that lymphocyte can become a T cell or a B cell. So he's going to tell this B cell that he just found a guy who looks like this. And he killed him. He says, I found this guy. He looks like this. I killed him. And in the process of killing them, I discovered that using this potion, whatever this potion is, this potion worked the best in, there, in killing them. So the B cell takes this information and says, well, thank you very much. And the B cell becomes a plasma cell. And the plasma cell makes something really cool. The plasma cell makes antibodies. And if you say, well, those antibodies look like the letter Y, you're right, because they actually do. They have sort of a shape to them that looks like the letter Y. So what do antibodies do? Well, remember this guy who came in and he looked like this and he had these things sticking out of him that looked very different than our antigens and they have a very unique shape to them. these green things that are sticking out, these proteins and glycoproteins that are sticking out have a very unique shape. Those antibodies that the plasma cell just made fit into these very unique shaped antigens like a key fits into a lock. Here's that Y shape that they would have. And we go up, it would continue up to look like the letter Y. <clears throat> so what that means, we have these very, 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 very unique antibodies that we created that fit into these very, very, very unique antigens that come into the body. Or at least these cells that have these unique antigens that come into the body. So the next time 
this bad guy comes in, these antibodies are going to snap onto him like magnets, fit right into those places, snap, 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 snap. And they're going to light him up. Light him up saying, we got a bad guy over here. Kill him. Oh, and by the way, in the process of killing him, this stuff works the best. Remember when I started this arc of a story, I said that this bad guy comes into the body and we have this Pac-Man got white blood cell over here that just stumbles across him, just luckily found him and said, hey, you don't belong here, destroys him. Well, now we don't have to worry about him just stumbling across him. Now we have antibodies that are specific to his little green antigens. So the next time he comes in with his little green antigens, our antibodies are going to snap onto him, light him up, say, come on and kill this guy. And by the way, when you kill him, this is the potion that works the best to kill him. somewhat simplified but basically and antigen or i'm sorry antibodies do other things as well but uh this this is just sort of the the first thing you can imagine them doing okay so now you learn a little bit about how lymphocytes become b cells and why b cells become plasma cells and where antibodies come from Let's consider something for just a moment. Let's consider a virus this is a virus. And a virus is made up of two basic parts. A virus is made up of DNA or RNA, ribonucleic acid, that's the directions. And then it's surrounded by some kind of protein, a protein coat around it. That's about it. Sometimes those little uh, antigens can be sticking out of it. Those little parts can be sticking out that can look like almost a crown which is why the coronavirus is called a coronavirus because it has these little particles sticking out of it that look like a crown around it. Hence the name coronavirus, crown virus. <clears throat> but let's say, for instance, this is hepatitis B, hepatitis B virus. Because the hepatitis B virus is a DNA virus. So inside is the DNA surrounded by this unique protein coat on the outside. Now, what's the dangerous part of this virus? It's not the outside part. It's the directions on the inside. That's what makes this virus dangerous. So if this hepatitis B virus with, this, with its DNA gets inside of a person's liver cells and inserts its DNA into the patient's DNA, well, now we have a problem. That's not good. But what if, what if I was able to take this virus and somehow destroy the dangerous part? Well, now it's not dangerous. Now it's just an empty shell. But remember, what do plasma cells make antibodies against? They make antibodies against the things sticking out of it. They don't make antibodies against what's inside of it. So if we just had an empty shell and we injected that empty shell into a person, that wouldn't hurt them. Would that be like a vaccine? Oh, my goodness. 
that would be a lot like a vaccine because now we're just giving them an empty shell. And again, I'm simplifying this a little bit, but now we have something that's not gonna hurt the patient. The dangerous part is not a factor any longer. So how do they take like the dangerous part out? Well, it doesn't exactly work like that, but I'm just sort of simplifying it. We're gonna, we can weaken the virus or attenuate the virus. <clears throat> so like, right. back to the, um, you know, when we were talking about HIV, you know, the people that have it and that they're on medication and stuff, how does that work to like help them? I don't want to tell you that right now. Can I tell you that in a few minutes? Sure. Okay, thanks. Because first we're going to finish this one because we're on the right track with vaccine. <clears throat> so imagine, and again, what we're injecting into the person is basically the shell of the virus. This guy is still going to eventually come across them still say, hey, you don't belong, still tell a B cell, B cell is gonna become a plasma cell, plasma cell is gonna make antibodies. So the next time this guy actually for real enters the body, the antibodies are gonna snap onto it and destroy it immediately before it gets the chance to make a problem in the liver. <clears throat> you see, the vaccine doesn't protect you like a force field surrounding you. It doesn't mean the virus cannot get into you, it can. But as soon as it does, it's gonna get destroyed. Now, let's say that virus that starts at the beginning here that we've wiped out a little bit, let's say that virus in this case is the flu, influenza. Well, here's the problem with influenza. Remember how it looks right here with the red and the green sticking out of it? Next year, it looks like this. Just a little bit different. But because it's a little bit different, these keys don't fit anymore. Those antibodies don't work anymore. So what do we have to do? Create a new vaccine. That little bit of a change that occurs over time, that's all that's required in order for those antibodies that we made to no longer work. So how does the flu evolve like that every year? Well, <clears throat> I don't know if I'd use the word evolve. I don't know if evolve is the right word. I'm going to say mutates. And even then, is that even the right word? Um, change. Okay, yeah, change. I, you know what? Change is probably the best word. Because remember, a virus isn't really a living thing. But it's not really a non-living thing either. So we can say change. So what causes it to change? That's a good question. Maybe something in its directions says, you've been like that too long. Now you need to be more like this. Wait, what classifies a virus as not being living again? It doesn't meet the criteria to be considered a living thing. What is it missing? Um, it does not... Rep, let's see, it does not replicate. It is not, it is not capable of replicating um, independently is one of the criteria. So viruses are, ha have to replicate inside of cells, basically. They don't have a cell membrane like a bacteria does or a fungus does. It's just a protein coat around it.
Well, one second. there's like four or five things all living things are made of cells they are not all living things must obtain and use energy they do not all living things reproduce they do not all living things can move or adapt to their environment mm, they kind of can but they do reproduce right well not in not, not independently. independently yeah because and this is kind of where i was going uh, when I was going to talk about HIV. And I said, I don't want to, I don't want to tell you about HIV right now, but I will in a moment, but I, but I will. So let's take our helper T cell. And we'll stick with purple for being the virus. Little purple star, HIV. When this moves into the cell, what it does is it takes its directions and introduces it into the directions here. So it would be like if I broke into a bakery in the middle of the night when no one was there and I took my recipes on cupcakes and chocolate cake and donuts and cookies. And I took my recipes and I stuck them into their recipe book. When the bakers come in the morning, what are they going to do? They're, they're going to follow the recipes. They're going to open up the recipe book and they're going to say, okay, to make these chocolate chip cookies, I need these ingredients to make this chocolate cake. I need these ingredients. And it's gonna, the bakers are gonna start making the stuff that I want them to make. All I did was stick my directions into their directions, my recipes into their recipes, but they didn't know I did it. And they're gonna use their sugar, their chocolate, their milk, their flour, their ovens, their manpower. And they're gonna make all the things that I want them to make. That's what this virus is doing. It's gonna introduce its directions. And now the cell is going to have, you know, an oven over here that is gonna be making things. And it's gonna have a tabletop over here for rolling out the dough. And again, I'm sticking with the bakery idea. And it's gonna have a mixer over here for mixing things up. So the cell is going to open up the directions, it's gonna find these directions and it's gonna say, oh, I need to make more of these. So it'll roll those out, it will mix them up, maybe mix them first, then roll them out and then take them over to bake them. And then it will make more and more copies of these. And each of these will go out and each one of these will then go into another helper T cell and do the same thing. In the process, I'm using up the, the HIV, not me, is using up all of the nutrients of the cell, which eventually is gonna cause the helper T cell to die. And then another one dies, another and more and more and more and more and more, and the body just can't keep up. So the medications that we, use now <clears throat> for people who are HIV positive and we don't want them to get to that point where their helper T cell count goes so, so, so low. What those medications do is some of them block right here. And some of them block right here. And some of them, of course, not surprisingly, are going to block over here. So that's gonna cause this cell to not be able to make so many of these uh, virus, 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 viruses. 
which means less of them are going to be going out, which means the body can now keep up and make more helper T cells. But the virus will always be there inside of you, right? Oh yes, not me, but inside the patient, yes. And here's the problem with HIV. You see what it looks like right now? Yes? Yes. Nope, it looks like this now. You see what it looks like now? Yes? Oh, so it changes like the flu. Oh, no, it doesn't change like the flu. No, remember the flu, I said this year it looks like this, next year it looks like this. Now do you see what HIV looks like right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, nope, doesn't look like that now. Now it looks like this. Do you see what it looks like right now? So how rapidly nope. does it? Now it looks like this. Do you see what it looks like right now? Nope, now it looks like this. It's the fastest mutating virus we know. So imagine if you just change the locks on your front door and you wanna get another key made. So you go down to Home Depot and they copy the key. And by the time you get back to your house, your locks have been changed again. There's no way to keep up with that. That's why we can't create a vaccine. It changes too quickly. Now I'm being a little bit overly dramatic when I say, nope, it looks like this, nope, now this, now this, now this, now this, now this. But look at how long it took us to create a vaccine for the coronavirus, Corona-19, COVID-19. And we've known about coronaviruses since the 1960s. It took us months and that was working as quickly as possible with people around the world all working on it at the same time, as quickly as possible, it took months and months and months. Finally got a working vaccine, finally got it out. We couldn't do that with HIV. It would have changed by now. It would have been different. This is why we don't have a working vaccine against HIV. There's no conspiracy theory. There's no conspiracy, not conspiracy theory. There's lots of conspiracy theories. There's no conspiracy. This is not something that um, they don't make a, uh, a vaccine for it because pharmaceutical companies are making too much money from the drugs. That's not it at all. Pharmaceutical companies lose money on those drugs. There's also another difference though, between HIV and COVID. HIV is communicable. COVID is contagious. What's the difference between communicable and contagious? Communicable, you gotta come in direct contact. There, you're, you're right, there's an intimacy between the people. And I don't mean like necessarily sexual intimacy, I mean sharing needles, intimacy, or a blood transfusion, intimacy. Even though you say, well, they don't have to know each other, that's not intimate. Well. It is intimate in that one person gave blood and the other person's accepting their blood. So in that way, it's, you, there's an intimacy, meaning a closeness. Contagious means 
someone just walked down the aisle ahead of you in Walmart and sneezed and then left the aisle and then you turned down that same aisle. You didn't even know they were there. That's contagious. So which one is easier to avoid? HIV. Communicable. HIV. Yes, exactly. Communicable. It's much easier to avoid than contagious. And I'm, I'm going to give you the extremes here, so don't freak out. Because people say, well, you know, if you have relationships with somebody and you're in a relationship, blah, blah, blah. Okay, here's the way to avoid never getting HIV as, as best as possible. Because we do screen for it now. So we screen blood for it now. So you're not going to find it in any of our blood banks. 99.9999999999% sure. Um, and you're not an, if, if you're not an IV drug user, you're not using drugs and sharing needles. Uh, have absolutely no intimate contact with another person. That's it. As compared to how do you not get COVID-19? Um, never leave your own house and never let anyone into your house and have a disinfecting station before anything enters your house, including mail. That's much more difficult. We kind of have to go outside. We kind of have to get groceries. We kind of have to, I mean, we can suit up and we can wash down things as we bring them into the house. And that would certainly make it much, much, much less likely that we'd get it. But we're not going to get HIV because somebody touched the, the screen at Wawa right before we did. However, we had COVID-19 that way. Remember, we touch our face two to 3,000 times a day, much more likely. Some people have even thought that HIV is a, like a biological weapon. It is not. Biological weapons, in order to be a good biological weapon, it has to be easy to disseminate meaning contagious, not communicable. It has to be something that'll be a disfiguring or, dis or ugly or painful. Nope, people with HIV look like normal people for decades. Uh, a good biological weapon will kill people. Well, HIV will probably eventually maybe a few decades from now kill a person possibly not like smallpox man smallpox you could sneeze and walk away or cough and walk away and infect six or seven other people but hiv was killing more people back then when no how many people how many people have died from hiv i don't know less than half a million Something like that? I don't know. Let's look it up. Because we just hit 500,000 people, right, in the United States died from COVID-19. Just in the United States. Oh, that was a lot of it. 32 million. Okay. Uh, since the beginning. Uh, let's see. Oh, 43%. So. 43% with COVID? No, this is with HIV. So 43% so, of I get it died? 30, 30, 32 million people have died since the known HIV epidemic. So that's 19, early 1980s. So that was 40 years. In 40 years, 32 million people died. That's less than a million people a year. Let's 
let's see. And in the past year, at COVID-19, I'm trying to find world worldwide. Um, two million people. So more than twice that of HIV. If we figure HIV about a less than a million people a year, COVID has already killed two million people in a year, which is not good. And that is, remember, that's contagious. That's people who did not engage in any sort of activity that may have put them at risk other than they went to a um, holiday party. That's kind of a big deal. Kind of scary. Now, still, this isn't smallpox. COVID-19, as, as bad as it sounds, is not as bad as things like smallpox. Thankfully, we eradicated that. So hopefully we're working on eradicating this. I don't know if that'll happen or not though. So I hope that answered some of your questions with HIV. Where we are now. Now you'll notice as we go through here, eosinophils two to 5%, I said, about 2%, basophils, I said less than 1%. So the numbers are pretty close. The agranulocytes, lymphocytes, we talked about those, can become T cells or B cells. And then there's another one called the monocytes. And monocytes are gonna become macrophages. They have this, you can always tell a, a monocyte, the nucleus sort of looks like a kidney bean. They're big, first of all, and the nucleus looks kind of like a kidney bean. Lymphocytes, you can tell because they're small and they're, most of the inside of it is nucleus. You see there's not as much cytoplasm. And these are going to go and become tissue specific. They're going to go to the skin and then stay there. They're going to go to the liver and then stay there. They're going to go to the spleen and then stay there. They're going to go to the lung and then stay there. So they're going to become tissue specific and just wait for things to come along so they can destroy them. Okay, coming from those. Then there's the platelets. Last thing I wanna talk about here, I think. Remember the platelets all come from that megakaryocyte that breaks apart. And each of those platelets is going to start in the process of blood clotting. So do we want clots to form? Yes, if we're leaking blood, if we're cut, we don't wanna to continue to bleed. So we definitely want clots to form. And these are the first things that are engaged in blood clotting or occur to cause blood to clot. So here, let's see, here's our blood vessel. We have a cut in our blood vessel here. Here's the lining of our blood vessel. And here is the rest of our blood vessel. So we have blood moving through here, but if there's a cut, we're going to have a leak and that's not good. So platelets are going to get activated and they're going to start to stick to this area where there's damaged lining of the blood vessel and they're gonna to stick to each other. They stick to the lining and they stick to each other. And they stick to the lining and then they stick to each other. And they stick to the lining and they stick to each other. And they stick to the lining and they stick, ah, oh, and look what happens. Now we have a little plug. 
so that now the bleeding will stop. And then of course we have other clotting factors that come in and make that a nice, strong, firm clot. That's what platelets do. Anytime there is <clears throat> damage or abnormality in the lot, <coughs> excuse me, in the lining of the blood vessel. <clears throat> Let me try that again. Anytime there is damage or a change, an alteration, there we go, in the blood vessel lining, platelets get activated and they will start to stick there. Okay, so do we want to make clots? Well, the answer clearly here is yes. Because if we're bleeding, we don't want to continue to bleed. So yes, we want to make clots. But then why is it some people take medication so they don't make clots? That's a good question. For those patients, if they happen to have a lot of cholesterol building up on this lining, the platelets are gonna see that as a defect. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna to stick to it and then stick to each other and stick to it and stick to each other and stick to it and stick to each other and stick to it and stick to each other. And look at how we just created a big blockage in this blood vessel. And if that's a blood vessel that is bringing blood to the heart muscle, if that's one of those coronary arteries, for instance, it's now getting less blood being sent to the heart muscle, the myocardium, which means those heart muscle cells are going to start to get strained and maybe even die. And that's not good because when those heart muscle cells die, part of the heart dies. We call that a myocardial infarction. Remember, an infarct is an area of dead tissue. And a myocardial infarction, or an MI, is also called a heart attack. So if people have this potential to make too many clots like this, then what we are going to do is we are going to tell them to take a certain medication every single day to stop that from happening. And that medication is called aspirin. Remember, uh, acetylsalicylic acid is the abbreviation for aspirin. Well, it's actually the abbreviation. ASA is the abbreviation for acetylsalicylic acid, which is the active ingredient in aspirin. So a lot of times, rather than writing the word aspirin, they'll just write ASA, which stands for acetylsalicylic acid. So what does aspirin do? Well, normally a platelet, as this on switch, so that anytime that platelet finds an area that is disrupted, it will stick to it and stick to other platelets around it. What aspirin does, aspirin turns that switch to off and then breaks the switch completely so it can never get turned back on again. In other words, it inactivates the platelet so that it will not stick anymore. So any platelet that is this aspirin is found will automatically oh shoot, will automatically be turned off and it'll be turned off completely. It's interesting. 
turned off for the life of the platelet, which by the way, I think I mentioned this, is about seven days. We call that irreversible inhibition or sometimes suicide inhibition because once we switch it off, we can't switch it back on again. We'll just have to wait. So if this patient is on aspirin a day therapy and the suddenly they decide that this patient needs to have their gallbladder taken out, so they have to have surgery for their gallbladder, they will say, stop taking your aspirin today and we'll schedule the surgery one week from now. Because in surgery, you don't want your patient bleeding out all over the operating theater. So we want them to clot. So we'll say, stop taking your aspirin now and we'll schedule the surgery for a week from now. So that way, all the platelets that are there are gonna be brand new, never seen aspirin before, and they're all gonna do exactly what they're supposed to do. So of course you might think, well, wouldn't that be bad? Because that, couldn't that cause them to form clots again? Yes. And so these are the things that are always sort of being weighed out, of the benefits uh, versus the consequences. What sh should, is it better to do this surgery or better to keep the patient on their medication? But well, that's how platelets work. This is also why if that person's taking aspirin a day therapy and you stick their finger with a needle, blood is gonna to continue to come out. It's gonna take longer for the clot to form. They're not going to bleed out from that because remember, you have to lose three out of five liters of blood in order to die. So no, they're not gonna bleed out, but it will take a little bit longer for them to clot than it normally would. Their blood's gonna to continue to run out a little bit more than normal. This is also why if a person is at home and they are having signs and symptoms that look like a heart attack, perhaps they're having chest pain, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath. They say they feel like there's an elephant sitting on their chest. Uh, they have pain that maybe radiates to their shoulder, down their arm or to their upper neck. They are diaphoretic, meaning they're sweating profusely, even though they're, they didn't do anything to sweat profusely. Then we say, you know what? Call 911. And while you're waiting for the ambulance, have that person uh, chew on a couple of baby aspirin. 81 milligrams, because if they're having a heart attack, what we wanna do is we wanna make sure the blood continues to flow. We don't want this to get worse. It will not break up the clot. It will not break up a clot. The aspirin does not break up the clot, but it does stop it from getting worse. And that could be the difference between life and death. Is there anything that can be given to break the clot up? That's a really good question. Yes. Something called tissue plasminogen activator, which is, there we go, sorry, also, which is often abbreviated TPA. Now, here's the thing about tissue plasminogen activator. Our body sometimes has to make clots. That makes sense because yeah, we get cuts or whatever, the, the remodeling process causes blood to leak from blood vessels. So it makes sense that, yeah, sometimes we have to make clots. The body is smart enough to know that if sometimes we have to make clots, once we're done with that clot, we need to get rid of it. So the body has things that makes clots. Therefore, the body also has things to break clots back down again. So what we give tissue plasminogen activator, this is something that is going to take 
something that we already make that our bodies already have that breaks up clots and activates it or activates the activator for it. So we're going to utilize what the body already has available to break up clots, but we're going to activate that stuff. So yes, we give something to tell the body, go ahead and release the clot breaking up stuff. But is it going to be like a long term? No. So the person will be so able to they'll, make they'll, clots. they'll make clots again. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. Good question, though. Anyone else? Yeah, Dr. Stegen, I have a question. Hey, sir, yes. um, is that why they have to get a, um, is that why they have to get, like, some people get stunts, like the stents, those metal rods and stuff like that in their legs? Not in their legs, in their heart, in the coronary arteries of the heart. A balloon, and we'll talk about this, a balloon angioplasty is going to put a catheter in the right spot and inflate a balloon, which is going to smash the plaque out of the way, which is going to open up that vessel. And then a spring loaded little stent will go in and it'll shoot right into that little vessel and it'll keep that vessel nice and wide and open so blood flows through it. So that comes after making sure that there's nothing in the way. Yeah. It's neat the way that it's done. A couple of things very quickly, by the way, let me show you this. This is out of your lab book. If you haven't done this, you really should. Um, this is the endocrine system. This is the picture that I used earlier, the diagram actually I used earlier, except here it asks you, you know, to match the name with the number which is a good exercise to do. And then take a look at, this is also from the lab book. It shows some blood smears. And you can see here, this is what an average blood smear is gonna look like. You're gonna see a whole lot of red blood cells, probably about one white blood cell. You see some, what looks like platelets over there, maybe over there as well. And then, all this space in between is not empty space. That's plasma, that's fluid. And of course there's plasma on top of these cells, there's plasma underneath these cells. So even though you might think, well, it's all smashed onto a microscope slide, true, but there's still a tiny thin layer of plasma underneath the cells and on top of the cells as well. Not to mention all that plasma in between. So make sure you review these. You can see some of these different, that looks like a lymphocyte you can see some of these different types of white blood cells. Oh, that's definitely a neutrophil. Look at that, um, that nucleus with all the different shapes to it. That's gotta be a neutrophil. What is that? Letter C? Yeah, neutrophil. So make sure you go through and check that out. Okay, next week a quiz on the endocrine system and hematology we just went over. So make sure that you follow that stuff. You already have not just the slides, but you also have the notes. I sent the notes to you as well. Please make sure you utilize those. Not to mention, um, you'll have this video shortly. So I'm gonna say goodbye for the video purpose. So have a good rest of your day.